All right, committee members, if I could have the folks in the room. Thank you. The folks on Zoom are so well behaved. There we go. So, um, assembly members, you're allowed to wait in your office until we get to your bill. It's not necessary that you are in the room. And actually, we, we prefer that because we have very limited space, so it allows room for other folks to be in the room. So with that, um, we were going to do a little bit of a work session, but um, speaker is not here, so I want him to be here when we start working some things. So let me go ahead and give everybody sort of a lay of the land of what we're going to call up first. This is, uh, we're in the second inning. And that way folks will know if they need to be close by. Oh, wait just a second. We might end up doing a work session anyway. Whether we do work session or not, this is going to be the batting order. We'll go ahead and pull up 170. And we'll just go right down the order, 170. We'll go to 224. We'll go to 341. Then we'll go to, no, excuse me, 241. Number three will be 241. And then we will do 247. And then we will get to 270. And then we'll move on from there. Uh, it may change up a little bit depending upon what happens this evening. We plan on being here as long as it takes to get through this tonight because time is short. So with that, I want everyone to understand, I'd like a two minute overview, two to three minutes of discussing the amendment. And for those members that are anyone, who, for members of the public in support, opposition, and neutral, we're just gonna do about five minutes each. We're not gonna spend 10 minutes in support, 20 minutes in opposition. We're gonna do five each. If you don't get in, please submit it. We have a, we have a lot to get done. And this is the fiscal committee, and we just want to make sure everything is aimed at the fiscal components of the bill. So that way we can uh, get our work done as quickly as possible. So we're going to pause here for just a minute and go from there. So give us all a minute to get everybody staged in the right spot. Okay, with that, we're going to go ahead and do a, a bill or two, and then hopefully we'll be able to break and get into a work session to keep stuff moving before the sun goes down. So with that, we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 170. I'll invite Ms. Martinez forward. I believe there's a... Oh, just a moment, Ms. Martinez. I apologize. Hold for just a moment, Ms. Martinez. I have two BDRs that need to be introduced. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, BDR 431174 relates to the Department of Motor Vehicles temporarily authorizing the department to collect a, a technology fee, making a supplemental appropriation to the department to pay the cost of issuing refunds of certain technology fees paid, uh, fees paid during fiscal year 2021 and providing other matters properly related thereto. So with that committee members, are there any questions on the bill draft introduction? Not seeing any, I'll accept a motion to introduce from Ms. Monroe Moreno, second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any in opposition? 
Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of members present. Second bill draft introduction, please. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. BDR S1175 makes a supplemental appropriation to the Department of Motor Vehicles for the cost of issuing refunds of certain fees paid during fiscal year 2021 and providing other matters properly relating thereto. Any questions from any committee members? Dr. Titus. I apologize. Uh, um, I, I know Ms. Kaufman has spent a lot of evenings here and it's getting tired, but she just faded off at the end, and so I didn't hear exactly what she said. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, BDRS 1175 makes a supplemental appropriation to the Department of Motor Vehicles for the cost of issuing refunds of certain fees paid during fiscal year 2021 and providing other matters properly relating thereto. So with that, committee members, any questions? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to introduce from Ms. Monroe Moreno, second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of the members present. With that, Ms. Martinez, thank you for your patience. We will go ahead and open the hearing on AB 170. Ms. Martinez. Good afternoon, Chair Carlton and members of the Assembly Committee on Ways and Means. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Susie Martinez, and I represent Assembly District 12, and I'm ple pleased to present Assembly Bill 170 for your consideration. <clears throat> Before I begin, I would like to note that there are two friendly amendments that have been submitted and should be available on Nellis. So with me today to present the bill and to discuss the proposed amendments are Jeff Dixon from the Humane Society, Francisco Morales from Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Sheck, and I also have with me the director from the Nevada Department of Agriculture who will discuss the fiscal note further. Assembly Bill 170 provides technical fixes to Senate Bill 342, which passed with bipartisan support in 2019. Assembly Bill 170 requires that a notice of the rights of a person lawfully arrested for certain crimes involving animals to request a hearing also be provided to a person who was lawfully issued a citation or such violations. The bill authorizes an animal control officer employed or officially de designated by a board of county commissioners or governing body of a city to prepare signs and serve written citations of persons to enforce law concerns concerning leaving a pet unattended in a motor vehicle and cruelty to animals. Additionally, the bill requires local detention facilities to post and maintain a written notice concerning the impoundment of an animal owned or possessed by a person who is arrested and detained. The bill requires the Department of Agriculture to create the written notice. With the Chair's permission, I will now turn it over to Jeff Dixon and Mr. Morales, who will discuss two friendly amendments that should be available on Nellis. And then after um, their brief remarks, Director Ott, um, the Deputy Director um, Conrad will also discuss the fiscal note. Okay, please proceed. Thank you, Assemblymember Martinez. This is Jeff Dixon. I'm the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. The, the amendment I'm discussing um, has to do with the notices. We've added uh, three sections to subsection two to, to section one of the bill. Um, this had to do with some confusion, um, well, some lack of specificity around the responsibility for creating and maintaining the signs. Um, as the assembly member said, we are, the, the Department of Agriculture will be creating the signs, but the signs have information on them, which needs to be um, maintained, and, uh, which needs to be kept current. So, what we're asking for in this amendment is that the shelters, uh, the government operated shelters that will be listed on this sign, they have a responsibility to uh, in, tell the Department of Agriculture of any changes to, the, uh, to their contact information. And then the Department of Agriculture is responsible for maintaining the list. And when there's any changes to the list, they're responsible for updating the uh, jail operators where these signs are posted. So what this amendment does basically is just assign responsibilities to the party that's most appropriate to handle it. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Ott, are you on the line? Uh, yes, Chairwoman, Chairwoman, this is Jennifer Ott, I'm the Director of the Department of Agriculture. 
If you could address um, the proposed amendment in the fiscal note and if those two pieces of the puzzle fit together. Uh, Jennifer, out for the record, yeah, the puzzle fit together. We submitted a fiscal note. It's approximately $3,000 every fiscal year for translation services and uh, printing of signage uh, required under the bill. Okay, thank you. So approximately $3,000 per year on the fiscal note. Okay. And with that, there's another amendment. Um, I have never seen so many amendments in ways and means in my career. So with that, um, we're drowning in amendments. So what, uh, this amendment is proposed by Brownstein, Hyatt, Barber, and Trek. So this uh, proposed amendment is? Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Carlton, uh, Francisco Morales for the record. So what we're trying to do here is um, there were some concerns about the delegation of police powers to non-government entities. And uh, we looked into statute, and it's something that has been done before. Um, it already exists in uh, 484B.470, where delegation of power um, is granted to volunteers to enforce handicapped um, parking violations. So what we're doing here is the city of, uh, or I should say Carson City, already delegates some of that uh, animal control powers to the Nevada Humane Society. They enter into contracts with them. And so we're making it clear that they also are allowed to issue citations because they're already the ones responding to uh, instances of animal cruelty. But with the exception that right now, they're not allowed to actually issue the citation. They have to go and pull a sheriff to come to the... Uh, uh, you know, situation, and then oftentimes the sheriffs don't have the time to do that, and we want to free them up to not have to respond to these calls and instead allow the the contracted body to be able to issue those citations. So we took the, the framework that already exists in statute. Um, we use the exact same language, obviously replaced it to uh, meet the needs of this bill, and we also capped it at 100 counties, less than 100,000. So you're going to give police powers to private citizens working for a nonprofit? Uh, Francisco Morales, for the record, that is correct. And whose who's idea was that? Uh, again, Francisco Morales, for the record, the, the problem exists. Carson City already, already subcontracts. They contract with the Nevada Humane Society to enforce uh, laws related to animal cruelty. And so uh, the problem is that currently they can respond to the call, they can impound the animal, but they can't actually issue any citations. They, they require the sheriff to come in and do that, uh, that actual uh, issuing of the citation. So uh, in that regard, to really make it more expedient and to allow them to also issue the citation on there and then and not take the sheriff off the street, this is why uh, we're looking to do this. And it is a very unique circumstance that exists in Carson City. Uh, I'm not aware that exists anywhere else in the state, certainly not in Washoe or Clark. But, uh, and that's why we decided to cap it at uh, populations less than 100,000. And it's my understanding that, in a way, what Carson City is doing right now is a little bit of outside of what they really have permission to do um, by, by subcontracting that out. So this basically clarifies that they now have permission to subcontract this function and move forward from there. Uh, Francisco, again, Francisco Morales, for the record. Uh, essentially, uh, yes, I mean, they, they, they've entered into the contract. Uh, the mayor of Carson City and Carson City generally think it's been a great partnership because they don't have the capacity to be able to uh, have a whole separate animal um, control department uh, in Carson City. Um, they've had a really good relationship with the Nevada Humane Society. It's worked out really well. Um, and so I think adding this additional um, authority will make things better and allow for them to really uh, issue the citations without having to pull the sheriff into every circumstance of potential animal cruelty or animal abuse. Okay, thank you very much. That's an uh, that's, uh, explanation. So with that any other comments or anyone else to present on the bill no 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 chair okay thank you 
So with that, then we'll go ahead and open it up for support, opposition, and oh, did you, we have some questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see anyone raise their hand, so I was just going to move forward. Dr. Titus. Thank you. Um, and just a quick question. Could you tell me how many um, citations Carson City issues annually or how many times they have to re request um, deputies to come to issue that citation annually? Jeff, would you happen to have that information? So there's no record keeping? We, we can get you that information and to the committee um, as soon as we find out. Okay. I'm just concerned about the number of incidents and, and again, the police powers, et cetera, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hafen, did you have a question? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and real quickly, the, the citations that will now be issued by the uh, nonprofit or maybe even a for-profit company, um, where would those funds go to? Would they go to a, a county fund, the, the police department, general fund, where Department of Ag? I, I'm, I don't see that in here. Uh, thank you for the question, Francisco Morales, for the record. Yeah, those funds would be, be, would be going back to Carson City. Um, and so they're essentially be, they would be they would be undertaking the functions of a, a normal animal control officer Other questions from other committee members at this time Ms. Bedinas Thompson Thank you so much and I, I apologize madam chair because it sounds like we're getting a little bit into policy But since the amendments here, I guess is it okay if I if I ask a couple of questions, okay? So I, I kind of hear what you're saying, which is um, when it, it, it seems like onerous to pull a, a sheriff away to say, come and ticket this person, I guess I'm not savvy enough to know about what other ways that this might be accomplished. I guess once a pet is impounded, then... Um, well, I guess I, I guess I should start by saying it looks like you're trying to cover the area between something that's really egregious in which a, a law office a law enforcement officer would respond and then, you know, just having the animal impounded. So the animal's impounded and taken out of harm's way. But you're saying there's no other way for the system to, I guess, look at responsibility for the, the homeowner or having accountability for the homeowner when if if there's cruelty involved in, or if there's abuse and neglect like I know the child welfare stuff but I'm sure this is different than that right <laughs> thank you for the question Francisco Morales for the record actually uh, obviously the, the, it's not a not to get too much into policy I, I don't want to get too deep into the parallel between child welfare but essentially it's it, it's very similar in that uh, you know we're dealing with with fundamental rights here of people too and so Again, I don't want to go deep into the bill, but the other provisions of the bill really strengthen the, the due process rights of the people that are being cited and or arrested. But normally you would have animal control officers employed as government workers and they would they would go and, you know, impound the animal, take them to the shelter and then do that process. Here in Carson City, it doesn't work that way. They, they've, um, they've contracted with the Humane Society and the Humane Society can respond to the instances of animal cruelty, torture, whatnot. Um, they can impound the, the pet or the animal, but they can't actually issue citations. So sometimes impounding an animal, taking the animal away, you still have to cite the person. And you can't do that right now. Um, certainly, you know, Carson City could um, stand up their own animal control actual department where those folks would be employed by the city of Carson City but I think just because of their size and because of, you know, uh, just the level of activity involved with, with um, that they have in Carson City, they think it's more efficient uh, to do it this way, where Humane Society could come, they can investigate, they can issue a citation, and they can take the animal and take it to one of their shelters all in one step. So that's what we're looking to do. It's very narrowly tailored. Um, as you can see from the amendment, the language, uh, mirrors that would already exist in, in granting volunteers um, some of this citation power. So it's certainly not something that, you know, we, we're doing for the first time. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. I just, 
I I appreciate it because I, I feel like you're saying we've got a problem here. I, I, it feels like there might be further conversation about whether or not this is the right patch for that problem, but I get, I get, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding kind of the service area, I guess we would say that the, the person Z was having a trouble feeling, so I was just trying to figure it out. Thanks. Mr. Watts, did you have a question? No? Ms. Gorlow. And then I'll go to Mr. Roberts, but then we do need to get to testimony. Ms. Gorlow. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question regarding the fiscal and the signs. Um, I see that it has to be available in English, Spanish, Tagalog, and Standard Chinese. Um, you're going to be doing some translation services. I was just wondering if any of that happened to be currently done in the department. And also, if you could tell me a little bit more about what the signs are made out of, how many you'll have to do. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, off of the record, I apologize for my uh, video being off. I'm losing connectivity here. Uh, we do not have translation services within the department currently. Uh, we hire those services through an approved vendor through the state. And uh, the uh, signs we estimate as part of our fiscal note that we would be doing 30 signs. Thank you very much. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, the question. <clears throat> so, uh, so I was involved in changing the statute to allow volunteers to write uh, citations for Las Vegas Metro, where I worked. And a uh, lot big difference between riding tickets to a parked car in a handicapped spot than issuing tickets to, to people. Uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges with that. And it, so it's, it's really not quite the same. And I'm just curious as to how many times have you had some of these instances where the officers couldn't respond or they did respond and didn't issue citations? Or do you have any, any data on that? Jeff, do you want to answer that? I, I wouldn't. No, I, I think that's a question for the Nevada Humane Society. And that was Mr. Dixon for the record, I believe. Sorry, yeah, Jeff Dixon for the record. You're welcome. I, no, 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 no. Um, so, okay. so we'll see what we can get. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, Chair. But I understand where you're going, writing a citation on a parked car versus writing a citation to a person that may have just had their animal impounded might be a totally different set of circumstances. So uh, with that, uh, are there any other questions at this time? Not seeing any. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Director Ott, for clarifying the fiscal note for us. So with that, this is the hearing on 170. I'll go ahead and open it up. Are the folks in the room in support of Assembly Bill 170? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Mindy Elliott with Capital Partners. Um, just want to draw your attention to a letter of support from the city of Carson from Mayor Bagwell. Um, uh, one clarification just for your reference is that the powers um, will come from the sheriff through the sheriff's department to the um, animal control officers. And Carson City is unique that the animal control officers, as well as the shelter, are run by the Nevada Humane Society. It's one and the same. So we will uh, be able to provide you some statistical data um, for your reference as it relates to how many citations had previously been issued, how many couldn't have been issued because the sheriff couldn't, couldn't um, uh, make it to whatever the incident might be. We're happy to provide that data for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else in the room in support? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom in support of SB1 or AB170? Not seeing anyone in Zoom. So with that, we'll go to broadcast services. Do we have anyone on the phone line in support of AB170? If you would like to testify in support of AB170, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in support. Thank you very much. Anyone in opposition in the room? Seeing no one come forward. Anyone in opposition on the phone line, please? 
If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 170, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in neutral? Seeing no one come forward, neutral on the phone, please. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 170, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, Ms. Martinez, any closing comments? Chair and committee, I would just like to say thank you for the privilege of your time and your consideration for Assembly Bill 170. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 170, and we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 224. I see Assemblywoman Duran coming in the door right now. And I believe Assemblywoman uh, Gonzalez is out there for 241. You're next up in the queue if you are listening. So with that, we'll let Ms. Assemblywoman get settled and then we will begin. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 224. Good evening, Madam, good meeting, good evening, Madam Chair Carlton and members of the committee. For the record, I am B. Duran. I represent Assembly District 11 in Clark County. Thank you for your time and consideration for Assembly Bill 224. This bill provides access to menstrual products in certain restrooms in public, middle school, junior high school, high school, and charter schools at no cost to the students. Samantha Glover, who is on the big screen over there, a 16-year-old from Reno High School, brought this bill to our attention to promote menstrual equity and decrease the stigma around period poverty. As well, some teachers were paying out of pocket for these necessary period products for students who didn't have access or who have, may have started their period unexpectedly. With that, Chair, I would like to turn over this to Mr. Brad Keating of Clark County School District and Lindsay Anderson of Washoe County District who are going to discuss the fiscal notes. I think we'll go to your co-presenter for just a moment. Okay. So this this. Welcome to Ways and Means. Not sure if you've ever testified before Ways and Means before, but if you'd like to give brief comments and then we'll have conversations about the fiscal note. So please go ahead. Honorable Chair and Committee members, my name is Samantha Glover. For the record, that's S-A-M-A-N-T-A-G-L-O-V-E-R. And I'd like you um, all to imagine any public restroom without toilet paper, toilet seat covers, paper towels, or soap. And asking students to carry around their own toilet paper just in case of emergencies. This is a reality for all menstruating students in Nevada. Um, one in four students um, have missed class time because they can't afford menstrual products. So today, um, in order to respect your time and understanding that there's a lot um, you all have to get done today. We've at requested that nobody comes to do public comment, but I would like to represent the 717 students, parents, and educators who have signed on and supported this bill and the 19 organizations that support. And I ask that you understand and consider the experiences of menstruating students in Nevada and the struggles that we have to attend class while on our period and making sure that these necessary products are not treated as a luxury in our schools. Thank you very much, and we do appreciate you not having everybody in Reno show up on public comment. We re that got you some points. So, with that, Ms. Duran, I think we'll go ahead and uh, those other, are you in support or presenters? What is your position? Presenters? Fiscal impact. Fiscal impact. I'll invite the two districts up for the fiscal impact conversation, and then we'll go from there. Ms. Anderson, Mr. Keating, Ms. Anderson, you're up first. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Lindsay Anderson representing the Washoe County School District. Um, 
super proud of Miss Glover. I'm also a Reno High alum, so proud to have our, our students participating in this process. Um, in terms of fiscal impact, based on the reprint, the first reprint of the bill, which did limit the number of schools we would be responsible for to 25% of our uh, secondary schools, uh, Washoe County School District submitted a revised fiscal note. Um, I'll just quickly say that our estimates uh, are approximately $20,000 a year for menstrual products and about $7,200 to do the initial installation um, of the dispensers in these schools. Uh, I know that there may be opportunities to get those products for less money, certainly through donations, and we would uh, look for those opportunities. Uh, as you know, we are subject to the procurement requirements as outlined in NRS 332, and so we can't commit to a potential vendor at this point. Um, but based on our research, that and a lot of assumptions, if you'd like me to go through those, I will, uh, in terms of how much usage um, we are anticipating. I'd be happy to do that, but otherwise I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you've covered enough. That's fine. Mr. Keating. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brad Keating, for the record, thank you for allowing Ms. Anderson to go first on this topic. Um, <laughs> But yes, as uh, with the Clark County School District, uh, similar to what Ms. Anderson said, our fiscal notes are uh, have been calculated similarly on both sides. Uh, based on the information from the reprint, we anticipate it'll be about $4,900 per school uh, between the dispenser and the products for each school year. Uh, as we've worked with the bill sponsor and Ms. Glover, we think we may be able to get that down, but it's just a matter of going through the purchasing uh, guidelines and, uh, and following those to figure out how many products will be used and how many dispensers, making sure that they, they don't break and all that fun stuff. So we will uh, continue working with the bill sponsor um, in this trial period uh, to see uh, what the cost is going down the line. Thank you very much. And would this be in every school or was this going to be, I believe it's 25% of the middle schools, junior highs, 25% of charter schools, and was it also 25% of high schools? So we're just talking a, a quarter of the schools. We're not talking every single school. And I'd like to understand how those schools will be chosen. Thank you, Matt. Oh, did you want Ms. Glover to answer nope, that question? No, I, I need you guys to because you're okay. the district. Sure. Uh, again, Lindsay Anderson on behalf of the Washoe County School District. I believe there was language added in uh, the amended version to indicate that uh, priority would be given to schools with the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch based on a past three-year average. Uh, and so that's how we've identified the schools potentially for Washoe County. Um, and again, it's a two-year pilot, but um, expecting full implementation after those two years is the expectation of the legislation. Uh, so we would expect to go to 100% of schools after the this two-year pilot project based on the current language. Thank you. And Mr. Keating, can you confirm the same for Clark County, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Brad Keating, for the record, uh, based on Section 3.3, we will uh, put we will do uh, do this moving forward in 25% of our uh, junior high and high schools, our junior high, middle schools, and high schools, uh, and it will be based on uh, the preceding three consecutive years, which schools of those had the highest percentage of pupils receive free and reduced price lunches. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure we had that all on the record for everyone. So with that, I thank you both very much for being here. To oh, I'm um, sorry. Dr. Titus has a question for you. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry to jump in there. I no, wanted no, to ask that's quite all right. the school districts uh, based on just going on record, just so you know where I'm coming from. I'm a proud primary sponsor of this bill. So obviously I'm supportive of this bill. So when you, when you talk about cost, uh, and those are real products, and I appreciate that you can calculate, you know, the cost of the cases and the dispensing machines, but just to kind of put it in perspective from a fiscal aspect, one of the reasons that this bill is important is that um, young women will not go to school frequently. And I'm wondering about if, what's the cost of a student not going to school? Do you get, you know, I know you get, counted per pupil funding and so many days they have to be in the school. Is there a cost besides the loss of education when a student is not in the classroom? Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to Assemblywoman Titus. You can go directly to the member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lindsay Anderson on behalf of the Washoe County School District. Uh, I think Ms. Glover probably has more data on that from a national perspective. I would just offer that um, our per pupil is based on enrollment, not attendance. And so attendance does not negatively impact our per pupil allocation at this point. Thank you. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tolls. Thank you so much, Chair, and, and I just wanted to confirm, too, that 
I believe we wrote into this bill that they can accept donations. Um, and so was any of that factored into your fiscal analysis, the, the possibility for having these products donated? Thank you, Madam Chair. Lindsay Anderson, Washoe County School District. Um, because we cannot predict what kind of donations we will get, our fiscal note is based on the full cost of the 25% of schools in the first two years. Thank you, and I, I do believe um, a co-presenter, Samantha Glover, had secured some some potential donations for this, and so I I am in support. It's a good bill. Period. It's not even seven o'clock. <laughs> so with that, um, we can get all those answers for folks as as we move forward. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, thank you very much for addressing the fiscal concerns. With that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 224. I'll go ahead and open it up for support. Is there anyone here in the room for support? Ms. Magnus? For the record, my name is Annette Magnus and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. I am here in proud support of Assembly Bill 224. As someone who has firsthand experience with this issue, I strongly support all students having access to menstrual products in our schools. This is desperately needed and worth the money spent to keep our young folks in the classroom and meeting their health needs. This is basic health care. If you can invest in these products for free in this building, our young folks in this state deserve the same. I commend Ms. Glover and Assemblywoman Duran for their hard work on this critical issue. Thank you. Anyone else in support in the room? Seeing none, uh, before we continue with support, there was one fiscal note that did not get addressed. I uh, overlooked it briefly. It's from the Nevada Department of Education. Do we have a representative from the Department of Education available in the room or online on Zoom? Mm, apparently no hands are being raised. Well, just for the record, Call I want, do we have someone? Let me make the announcement, Chair. I'm sorry. If you would like to make, pardon me. If you would like to testify in support of AB 222, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And, and thank you, Broadcast Services, but I'm actually looking for a representative from Nevada Department of Education on Zoom, if anyone is available. If you would raise your hand to be recognized so that Broadcast Services knows that you are there. Apparently not. We do have a fiscal note from the Nevada Department of Education, but we will investigate it further and go from there. We won't slow down the hearing for that. So with that, we'll go ahead and go to uh, support uh, on the phone lines. If we could go ahead and open up the phones for support, please. If you would like to testify in support on AB 224, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 199, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tess Opferman, that's O-P-F-E-R-M-A-N, speaking on behalf of the Nevada Women's Lobby. I too have experience in this realm. Um, menstrual cycles can be difficult and embarrassing um, for adolescents and they can also be financially prohibitive. Um, for that, we think this is a good investment of the state and well worth the funds to make sure menstrual cycle products are in schools um, to take away this barrier for young women. We thank you for your time this evening and we urge your support. Thank you very much. With that, is there anyone else in support on the line? Chair, there are no other callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone in opposition in the room? Seeing no one come forward, anyone in opposition on the phone line, please? If you would like to testify in opposition, 
to AB224, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify on the line in opposition to AB224. Thank you very much. Anyone in neutral in the room? Not seeing anyone come forward. Anyone in neutral on the phone line? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB224, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, I believe we can go ahead and uh, any closing comments from Ms. Glover or Assemblywoman Duran? Not Thank seeing any closing co comments from Ms. Glover, Assemblywoman Duran. Okay. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair Carlton. Um, for the record, my name is V. Duran. Um, five other states previously passed similar bills to this, and attendance did increase by 2.4% for young women that had uh, these uh, free period products supplied for them. And just with that, I would um, like to conclude my presentation with a quote. When New, Sh New Hampshire's Governor Chris Sununu signed a similar bill into law in 2019, he said, New Hampshire's bill would help ensure young women can learn without disruption and free of shame or fear of stigma. It's my hope that we can give our students in Nevada that same opportunity. Thank you again for taking the time to consider this message. I mean, this measure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rand. We Thank appreciate you. that. We'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 224. And if uh, Ms. Gonzalez has made, is going to make her way downstairs, I need Ms. Gonzalez. And then from there... We'll go to uh, Mr. O'Neill. We'll have Mr. O'Neill come back in. Well, Ms. Gonzalez, yes. welcome. Mr. O'Neill, you're in the bat. You're in the um, batter's box, or you're you're in the warm-up circle. So head on down, Mr. O Assemblyman O'Neill. With that, Ms. Gonzalez, welcome to the committee. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 241. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Assemblywoman Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, Assembly Bill 241 provides good time credits in the event that we unfortunately have to experience a pandemic again. Um, right now the issue is uh, that folks aren't able to program due to how um, transferable the, the virus was. So in the event that we ever have to experience that again, this will have in statute that folks will be able to receive five credited days per month for up to 60 days. Um, do, not due to, we have come to a con uh, an agreement with all stakeholders involved around the current pandemic. And so you will see the, um, the amendment, I'm sorry, I don't think I sent the amendment because I got it super late, but the amendment took out the um, retroactiveness of the bill, um, and NDOC can speak more to the agreement that we have come to, um, but posted on Nellis, you will see the two letters from the Department of Corrections and Nevada Probation and Parole where they have removed their f fiscal notes for this bill. And um, with that, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, any questions for the Assemblywoman? If we could get that other amendment as soon as possible, that would be very helpful. Yes, I have uh, Assemblywoman um, Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. I have the mock-up in my email, so I will definitely send that over. I got it a little late um, due to just some small language clarifications in the bill. Thank you very much. So with that, any questions of Ms. Gonzalez? Seeing none, Ms. Wilburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada. I'm just here as a lifeline to Assemblywoman Gonzalez. We've worked on this bill from the beginning and she sponsored it on our behalf for um, the thousands of um, inmates who had lost good time credit and were not able to um, qualify for their parole release. So I think that this will make a huge difference moving forward. All right. Any questions from the committee at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get that amendment. We'll go through it and make sure that everything trues up. 
So with that, the fiscal notes seem to be addressed. We'll get everything all confirmed. So this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 241. So we'll go ahead and open it up for support, opposition, and neutral. If there is anyone in the room in support, uh, we do have someone on Zoom. Are you here in support or were you just uh, back up? Uh, for, the, for the record, Victoria Gonzalez, I'm here to testify in the neutral position from the Department of Sentencing Policy. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up. Anyone in the room in support, please come forward. Uh, good evening, Chair. Very much an honor and a pleasure. I believe you need to push the button to turn the microphone on. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I'm a tad bit nervous how you run your decor, so let me just get get it and out as quick as I can. You, you saw us have fun in here this yeah, morning, no, so I, it's uh, Listen, we're if all there good. was a Nielsen rating, my house would be pumped for you. We, we watch it regularly. <laughs> no, sincerely, um, uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, my name is Jagata Chambers. I'm, I'm actually a resident in Las Vegas, 89113, in complete support of the bill. Um, I'm actually leading the rights restoration work for Silver State Voices, so I've invested a lot of time mailing legislation into the Department of Corrections and allowing that to circulate with the goal of having um, constituents in custody be the, the mindset of the body. Um, and needless to say, there was two pieces of legislation that flourished amongst the compounds, and it was Assembly Bill uh, 241, as well as Senate Bill 187 around confinement from um, Senator Spearman. Just complete support. Um, the pandemic hit the Department of Corrections just like it did, and there are several people that should be home right now if they could have been able to program. So please, if this body is able to support, um, it would definitely impact the Department of Corrections in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and proceed. And you did a great job. No reason to be nervous. <laughs> Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders, and I'm a policy director with Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada in support of Assembly Bill 241. We just want to thank Assemblywoman Gonzalez for bringing forward this bill and NDOC for their commitment to impl implement this policy. I will echo the remarks of Jagata Chambers, who spoke before me, and urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Proceed. Benjamin Chalonor, Policy Director for Faith in Action Nevada. Um, we, we also would like to echo the sentiments of uh, previous speakers and thank uh, Samuel Gonzalez and, and DOC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the room in support? Seeing none, anyone on Zoom in support? Seeing none, anyone on the phone line in support, please? If you would like to testify in support, <coughs> pardon me, on AB 241, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll go to opposition in the room. Is there anyone in the room in opposition? Not seeing anyone in opposition. Anyone in opposition on Zoom? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized. Anyone in opposition on the phone line, please? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 241, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one online to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcast Services. Anyone in the room in neutral? Seeing none, I believe our folks on Zoom are in neutral. Um, so I'll go ahead and open it up to uh, Ms. Gonzalez, and then gentlemen, I'll have you go afterwards. Ms. Gonzalez, please. Thank you, Chair. Again, for the record, Victoria Gonzalez, the Department of Sentencing Policy. Our department is tasked with assisting the Sentencing Commission in tracking the fiscal and practical impacts of legislation or policies that have impacts on the criminal justice system and the prison population. When AB 241 was first introduced, we worked with agencies and the sponsor to evaluate the fiscal impact of the legislation and balance that impact with the fiscal notes that were submitted. Now the fiscal notes will be removed. Our department will still work with the agencies and the sponsor and any interested stakeholders to measure any costs or savings resulting from AB 241 and then report this information to the legislature, the sentencing commission and the public. We believe this information will assist the legislature and everyone else when it comes to evaluating the fiscal impact of legislation like this and any policies related to it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen? Good evening, uh, Chair. Privileged to thank you. Um, in the interest of brevity, I will just echo what uh, Victoria Gonzalez said. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, record. please, for the record, Mr. Wickham. Yes, ma'am. For the record, this is Harold Wickham, Deputy Director, Nevada Department of Corrections. Again, I just want to echo what uh, Victoria Gonzalez says. It's been privileged to work with Chris Rico and Assemblywoman, Assemblywoman Gonzalez on this uh, action. So thank you and ditto. Thank you very much. Next person. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Rico for the Board of Parole Commissioners. Uh, we are neutral on this bill. Uh, as Assemblywoman Gonzalez mentioned, uh, the amendment has not yet hit, but I know that all the hard work that we did with Assemblywoman Gonzalez, the ACLU, Department of Corrections, the parole board is able to remove its fiscal note as long as everything is uh, as indicated. And I believe it was mentioned earlier by Assemblywoman Gonzalez that the uh, fiscal note was from parole and probation, but it was not. It was the Board of Parole Commissioners, and I'm available to answer any questions if necessary. Thank you very much. I don't see any committee members wishing to be recognized for questions at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Gonzalez and gentlemen, for your testimony in neutral. I'll go ahead and move to the phone lines. To those in neutral, please. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 241, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Ms. Gonzalez, did you have any closing comments? Um, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. No closing comments. And just wanted to thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations on your first presentation to Ways and Means. It's not as scary as everybody told you, was it? OK. That's because the sun hasn't gone down yet. All righty. So um, with that, I did call up Mr. O'Neill. Um, I, I apologize, Majority Leader. I accidentally skipped you. I'll, I'll go back to you after I do Mr. O'Neill. So Mr. O'Neill, if you would go ahead and come to the table. We'll go ahead and open up Assembly Bill 270. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time. I'll try to make this very quick. I'm P.K. O'Neill. I'm Assemblyman for District 40, which covers all of Carson City and parts of Southeast Washoe County. I'm here today to present to you AB 270, a bill which deals um, with the Stewart Indian School Mu and Museum and the Nevada State Prison Preservation Society. In short, it's a great bill. It's a good bill. It'll do good stuff. I was passed out of uh, government affairs back on April, several weeks ago. <laughs> uh, there's only one physical note attached to it that I'm aware of from the Department of Corrections. It basically offsets the, where their expenses are offset by the revenue they'll gain from events there. Was that short enough for you? Would you like more, Madam Chair? Nope, that's good. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Neill. We appreciate it, Assemblyman. So with uh, that, are there any questions of the Assemblyman at this time? Not seeing any. With that, um, if we could have someone address the fiscal note, please, whoever you have in the queue, to talk about the fiscal note. Let's get that on the record next. The record, Madam Chair, Jeff said, the Department of Corrections. Uh, the fiscal note is basically zero, no impact to the department. Any money Department of Corrections has for outlay will come from revenue for use of the facilities. We're not planning to expend more money in the facility than is available for user fees. There were two, uh, or there was an exhibit submitted that has roughly the estimates for an annual basis of those fees. That's all coming from facility use fees. So with that, the intention is this would be um, neutral, money in, money out. Correct. Okay. We got a, got a head nod and a, and a yes. It's, it's a little broken up, so I just wanted to make sure that I repeated everything for the record. Thank you very much. So with that, committee members, any questions? I'm not seeing any at this time. Thank you. Gentlemen, very much. This is the hearing on the bill, so we'll go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone in the room in support of AB 270? 
Good evening, Madam Chair. For the record, Marla McDade Williams with Strategies 360, um, representing the Reno Sparks Indian Colony this evening. Just want to thank Assemblyman O'Neill for recognizing that a similar measure what came forward to the body last session, um, and it, somehow it got mixed up and wasn't able to get through. So we appreciate adding the Seward Indian Museum to this bill and ask for your support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. With that, um, is the person on Zoom in support? Please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Stacy Montooth. That's spelled S-T-A-C-E-Y. Montooth is M-O-N-T-O-O-T-H. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Indian Commission. And is this good, solid legislation, as Assemblyman O'Neill has already outlined, as it will provide a revenue stream for the Nevada Indian Commission Cultural Center and Museum with no fiscal impact per our fiscal note. We wholeheartedly support this. Thank you and your entire committee for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Montooth. Anyone else on Zoom in support? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized on Zoom. We'll go to the phone lines. Anyone in support? If you would like to testify in support on AB 270, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in support at this time. All righty, so with that, we'll go to opposition. Is there any opposition? Mr. O uh, Assemblyman O'Neill, if you would step back, please. Thank you. Appreciate it. So with that, is there any opposition in the room? Seeing none, I don't see anyone on Zoom wishing to be recognized. Is there any opposition on the phone line? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 270, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one online to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, is there any neutral in the committee room? Seeing no one in neutral, no one on Zoom. Is there any neutral on the phone line? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 270, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in neutral at this time. All right, thank you very much. So with that, I believe Mr. O Assemblyman O'Neill, do, do you have any closing comments? Thank you, good night. Thank you, good night. I'm good with that. <laughs> One thing I can say is you follow directions very, very well. Thank you so much. So with that, committee members will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 270, and I'll apologize to the Majority Leader for skipping her on Assembly Bill 247. Would you like to go ahead and proceed now? So committee members, we will go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 247. Good evening, Majority Leader. Please proceed. Good evening. Thank you, Chairwoman um, Carlton and members of the Ways and Means Committee uh, for hearing Assembly Bill 247. With me, I have Ms. Um, Allette, uh, Ms. Jennifer Allette, who is the director of the WICHI program, the Western Regional Education Compact. In a nutshell, what the policy is doing is modernizing the compact. I think most of the language um, really hasn't been touched since the compact was put in place. So we saw um, some archaic references and decided to do some cleanup around it but the piece that is driving the fiscal notes and which is important piece is also addressing different parts of the stipend program that exist in here that that just kind of have been wonky in a way and I think make the program less effective and a less effective tool than it can be converting those stipends to loans and then um, the fiscal effect is coming in future by NEMs of about four hundred and nine thousand dollars um, from some of the uh, not having those stipend piece paid back. So specifically section 14, um, the way that these types of programs are set up, there is there are 
two different programs, and so this is dealing with the loan stipend piece in the PSEP program, which is the... If I can find my notes. Jennifer, help. Jennifer. <laughs> It's the professional student exchange. Program. Yeah, there we go. The professional student exchange. So right now, what happens is they get um, a stipend that is um, there's a low a 75 percent and a 25 percent component. And what we ask for them to do is the 75 percent is forgiven upon meeting the conditions of the loan, and then sorry, the conditions of the stipend, and then we have a 25 percent loan compayment that that we ask them to pay back. And so that's the piece that we want to look to converting to a loan. And then with new contracts going forward, not have that 25% so that that whole 100% would be resources for the student to use. Um, but then also in section 17, there's a change to um, the interest rates as the language is written. Instri interest rates are living in statute. And that just doesn't seem right because they're flat and they're fixed and they're not flexible. So the proposal in section 17 is to move them over into um, regulations where they can be more fluid and the board can have more control in terms of setting a competitive interest rate. So I'll stop there and hand it over to Ms. Um, Olette. Thank you very much, Majority Leader, and Ms. Olette. Thank you, Majority Leader. My name is Jennifer Olette. I'm the Director of the Nevada Office of the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. and. I am, I'm speaking before you tonight specifically about section 14 and the 25% loan component that is attached to our funding. We are the only state in the West that requires students or recipients of our funding to have an employment commitment in order to fulfill their obligation and repay a portion of the funding. And when we have looked at the way that the staffing structures are across the West, we found that administering that loan has made our office significantly overstaffed compared to other offices across the West. There is a presentation online for you, but I don't need it. You can look at it at your leisure. And um, what we would really say is, um, I believe that the effects, which would be $205,000 in reductions in future revenue over future biennia can be reduced somewhat through a few different things, which is a potential reduction in staff as there would be less work to administer. And then also by changing some of our penalties and interest rates, which are currently in statute, moving those over to regulations, we can actually apply penalties in that is collectible and um, sort of offset some of that loss in revenue there. So it's my hope that ultimately this will be a revenue neutral proposition, but there is a possibility that this could lead to future um, increased general fund appropriations, which is why you are hearing this right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Ouellette. Are there questions from the committee at this time? I know Witchy and student getting getting students here, especially in those profession, professions that we really need, um, has, has been an interesting journey over the years in trying to figure out how to make this work, which he's been moved around a number of times too on top of it. So we've, I think we finally got it in the right place, we hope. And there you are, Majority Leader, I know. Uh, <laughs> and so basically 75% of the loan is forgiven so if they do do their service in the state, we're going to forgive the other 25% also? Is that correct? Thank you so much for the question. Yes, yes. Assemblywoman Benita Thompson. Sorry, Ms. Ouellette. So 75% um, of the support fee is a stipend that can be waived if the student returns to Nevada to practice for the same same number of years. And then the 25% is uh, a support fee and is, a, is a loan which students must pay back with interest at five to 10 years after graduation. Those are Nevada-specific rules. And they might have made sense kind of, um, you know, when, um, you know, what she's been around, the Western uh, Interstate Commission for Higher Education has been around since 1953, and Nevada's been a member since 1959. Um, and and so that 
nowadays, it just it, it never made sense to me why the program was like, hey, stay in Nevada and do this, and if so, you can pay back 25%. So it just seems like a more fair deal to to um, to to not have it be a, a quarter that has to be paid back, especially if they're staying in the state and making and with their work obligations and commitment. Thank you very much. Any questions from any committee members at this time? Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. Thank you, Ms. Olette. Uh, do you have any other presenters? No? So with that, this is the hearing. So we'll go ahead and open it up the hearing for Assembly Bill 247. Is there anyone in the room in support? Not seeing anyone in the room in support. Is there anyone on Zoom in support? Not seeing anyone on Zoom. We'll go to the phone lines, broadcast services. Do we have anyone on the phone lines in support of AB 247? If you would like to testify in support of AB 247, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room in, in opposition? Seeing no opposition in the room, no one on Zoom. Is there any opposition on the phone line? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 247, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the room in neutral? Seeing no one, no one on Zoom. Is there anyone in neutral on the phone line? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 247, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, Ms. Benitez Thompson, any closing comments? None, she's gonna pass, very good. With that, we'll close the hearing on Assembly Bill 247, and we go, we'll go to Assembly Bill 280, which is, I believe, Ms. Peters. We'll invite Ms. T Peters to the testimony table. Good evening, Ms. Peters. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 280. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Assemblywoman Sarah Peters, I represent District 24 in the heart of Reno. And I'm um, happy to present AB 280 today, which very um, succinctly designates that all uh, single stall bathrooms in the state of Nevada that are open to the public, or publicly accessible, should be non-gendered. And I think we all have had scenarios where we've gone to a rest stop or um, a gas station and there are single stall bathrooms in the women's line. It's a mile long and there's nobody on the other one and there's no difference between the two except for maybe a urinal. And so this bill just makes it plain that in the state of Nevada we just don't need those gendered signs. Um, I could go into more detail about the importance of that, but because this is the fiscal committee, there have been a number of fiscal notes on this bill, most just for the sign replacement. The general consensus is that through state purchasing, those signs cost about $100 a piece. Um, there's not a lot I can do about that, although I did find signs on Amazon, not my favorite venue, um, to purchase these kinds of things from um, for $20. So there's a fluctuation in the cost of these um, signs. There were some fiscal notes removed, um, including NG's fiscal note. They did to, um, send me an email, and I think that they sent a revision to staff that they were able to absorb the cost. Um, the Department of Administration Public Works, Works Division, they retained theirs, um, but it's uh, relatively nominal at $9,065 for all of their um, single stall toilets across the state. And the Conservation and Natural Resources State Parks Program did have a fiscal note of $40,320, um, although they did um, happen to off the record mention that they may be able to absorb that if their maintenance budget remains whole, uh, but I don't have control over that piece. So um, the school districts and counties submitted fiscal notes. A number of these um, miss 
interpret some of the bill language, some of the expectation was that there would be retrofit related to the implementation of the bill. The only, the only change is taking off those gendered signs. There's no obligation to specific language on what the sign has to look like, only that it doesn't pertain to a single gender that can enter or leave that bathroom. Um, so I, I did reach out to all of them and was turned down for conversations with most of them. All right. Thank you very much. Committee members, uh, questions of Ms. Peters. So I won't admit that I ignore the signs. <laughs> but I understand what you're, where you're trying to go. So with that, I don't see any questions. Thank you very much. Let's pin down the fiscal notes a little bit more and make sure that staff has all the information as we move forward. So if you would make sure that Ms. Kaufman has has the email. I'm not sure if I got it, but there's too many emails. So just make sure she has all the information and we'll proceed from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, no other presenters, I believe. So this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 280. Is there anyone else here in the room in support of Assembly Bill 280? Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We fully support investing in gender-inclusive, gender-neutral restrooms so that our transgender, non-binary, and families have access. Many of the cost projections seem alarmist and overinflated, and I, too, ignore the signs myself. The cost of changing signage is worth it for a more inclusive Nevada. Please support AB 280. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else in the room in support? Not seeing anyone else in the room in support. No one on Zoom. Anyone in the phone line in support of Assembly Bill 280? If you would like to testify in support on AB 280, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 070. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair Carlton and Assembly Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you for this time. For the record, my name is Jasmine, J-A-S-M-I-N, Margarita, M-A-R-G-A-R-I-T-A, -A -A, Tobin, T-O-B-O-N. Um, I'm an organizer with Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada. Uh, Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada is in favor of AB 280. While they are a necessity for all people, for gender diverse Nevadans, bathrooms can be a place and source of harassment, policing, bullying, and violence. Please support um, AB 280 uh, for a more safer, more inclusive Nevada. And thank you to Assemblywoman Sarah Peters, who sponsored AB 280, and Assemblywoman Selena Torres, who co sponsored this bill. Thank you again for this time. Thank you. Anyone else on the phone line in support? Caller with the last three digits, 653. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good, beautiful evening to you, Madam Chair Carlton and the rest of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Dora. Martinez, D-O-R-A-M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z, and I do um, uh, support AB 280, and I'm here representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. And Madam Chair, I wish I had an option, I wish I had a choice of ignoring the sign. I am totally blind, and before the COVID started, my dog and I go everywhere, traveling all over Reno and, and Nevada, and Las Vegas and Carson, and he has brought me to the men's bathroom um, and some people and just for the record and I'm glad I have the opportunity to say this service dog do not know how to read so I he when I say please go to the bathroom he just takes me to the nearest and no line a miracle so thank you so much have a good evening thank you Ms. Martinez I think that's one of your best stories so far this session I congratulate you so um, with that, is there anyone else in support on the phone lines, please? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in opposition in the room? Not seeing anyone in opposition in the room. No one on Zoom. Is there any opposition in the phone line, please? 
If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 280, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that, is there anyone in neutral in the room? Seeing no one in neutral, no one on Zoom. Is there anyone in neutral on the phone line? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 280, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral to testify at this time. Thank you very much. Ms. Peters, did you have any closing comments? Not seeing any. We'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 280. Committee members, the Majority Leader has graciously purchased dinner for you. We're going to take a very, very, very short pause for folks to grab something and bring it back. Okay, because the longer you take your break, the longer we'll be here later. So we're going to take a, a very short pause, allow you to grab whatever you need to grab. Um, and then when we come back, we will continue with the agenda. We seem to be doing fairly well. So we're going to recess very briefly. Thank you.
All right, committee members, I think we can go ahead and come back. So the next bill on our agenda, typically what happens in Ways and Means is we have requests from some very interesting and worthwhile projects and or nonprofits in the state that come and ask us for some assistance and it benefits them in a number of ways. It helps them provide some of the services. It also shows on their sheets when they move forward that the state is behind them and it helps them leverage more dollars in the future. So typically what we do is we pick one bill and then we add, rather than having everyone draft a bill for their individual issue, we just ask them to bring conceptual amendments to the one bill and then we process it all at one time. There would typically be one in the Senate and there would typically be one in the Assembly. We would sit down, we would talk about it all and we would go from there. It's just a little bit different this time. Um, I believe there'll just be one out of the Assembly this time. I'm not sure what the Senate, uh, what their, their game plan is at this moment, but this is our night to do this to make sure that the time frames work, that the bill moves um, into the other house with enough time to be processed. So the next bill is Assembly Bill 355. So we'll have the hearing on Assembly Bill 355. It's the chair's intention to have the hearing on Assembly Bill 447 also. And what we would do is put those two bills together and then the uh, folks that are in the room that have uh, proposed conceptual amendments we will have conversations and questions on those different items, and then we'll take all those components and put them together into one bill. So that's kind of the game plan uh, as we move forward on this. So we'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 355, makes an appropriation for the allocation to the International Gaming Institute of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for the Expanding the Leaderverse Initiative, which increases the diversity of leadership in the gaming industry. I believe I have um, my favorite mayor, Jan Jones, on Zoom to, um, and I believe you'll be presenting the bill, Ms. Jones? Yeah, well, I'm gonna have Bergard, the executive director of the International Gaming Institute open, and then you will okay. go to me. All right, so with that, who's ever queued up, please proceed and we will go from there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Bo Bernhard. I am the Executive Director of the UNLV International Gaming Institute and proudly present an update on a project introduced two years ago by the historic female majority legislature that we boasted two years ago. Uh, and I'm thrilled to report that during, of course, a very difficult two years, we have achieved exactly what we dreamed this project would. 100% uh, of the participants are from Title I schools uh, in, the, in the Clark County School District. 84% of them uh, speak English as a second language. 100% of them, however, after going through the program, graduated from high school, which is a remarkable figure given the statistics that we typically see in these under-resourced neighborhoods. Even more impressively, 100% of them went on to college. 100% um, of them were in fact the first in their families to go to college. And I would suggest we're doing nothing short of changing family trees uh, with these very programs. Uh, I was realizing as I did the math, I started in public schools in Nevada at the age of three. Uh, I have now gone through 40 years, both as a student and now as a professional in the public school system in Nevada at various levels. And this is the thing of which I am proudest to be associated with in all of those years. So to tell a little bit more of those stories, I'd like to turn over to Jan Jones Blackhurst. And then after that, Becky Harris. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very Madam much. Chair. Madam Chair and members of the committees. Oh, yep, no, I am on YouTube. Jan Jones Blackhurst for the record. And Madam Chairwoman, just for the record, you still scare me after 30 years in politics. You're the one. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to present tonight. The Leaderverse Bill has really allowed us to do magnificent things in reaching out to students 
around Clark County and making sure that our future leaders look like the community that we live in. I would ask for an amendment tonight. We had found a private sponsor match in the Wynn Corporation who matched us 250 each year of the biennium in the last two years. Um, we have a $750,000 match. So if we could increase the match to 375,000 from state government for each year of the biennium, we would be greatly appreciative. Happy to answer any questions. This is a program we're very proud of and it's one that the chairwoman and other members of the legislature helped us realize. Thank you very much. And with that committee members, you do have an amendment that was proposed and you will see the strikeout of 500,000 and the insertion of 750,000. And just to make sure, uh, Ms. Black, Ms. Blackhurst, so the, um, it broke up a little bit, but there is a full match to this. So the, the impetus to yes. increasing it is to utilize every match dollar that will be available. That's correct, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you we very much. Match. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So with that, are there any questions from the committee members on this particular program? I don't see any questions from any committee members. Thank you very much for the update. I'm so pleased. It's going so well. That's wonderful. Uh, do we have another presenter. Would you like to go ahead and speak? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. The hour is late and you've got miles to go. I'll be very brief. You have a PowerPoint presentation that's been provided to you. It's up on Nellis to thoroughly go through the programming that we've engaged in. In addition to those programs, I just wanted to highlight briefly for the committee that the Leaderverse has also engaged in significant research to better understand how women, how women of color and those from underserved communities are employed, what kind of opportunities are available and the types of contributions that they make to the workforce. We are grateful for the legislative investment from 2019. It provided a foundation from which we're able to embark on our ambitious programming, conduct research and publish those results. And an additional investment would allow the Leaderverse to continue to deliver its data-driven research-based programming to Im improve the lives of underprivileged youth provide support for first generation college students and provide pathways to employment for underrepresented communities throughout Nevada. And with that, um, I have nothing further, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. It's nice to get good news on a bill. So with that committee members, are there any questions? Not seeing any questions. Um, this is a unique situation where because we're going to be building another bill in um, rather than go through support opposition and neutral at this particular time, we're going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and call up uh, Assembly Bill 447 and have the hearing on that also. Then we'll go to support, opposition, and neutral. And in the neutral position, we will have the folks who are going to be presenting their conceptual amendments uh, to propose uh, other items to be encapsulated in the bill. We, they're not in support or opposition, but they are in neutral, but they will be proposing an amendment. So with that, it, th thank you very much for being here. You're welcome to stay for a bit, but not necessary. So with that, I'm going to go ahead. Hold on for just a moment. So in order to keep the record clear, we're going to go ahead and do support opposition and neutral on 355 now, and then I will pull up 447 immediately afterwards, do the same thing, and then the uh, committee will address an amendment that will encapsulate everything all into the same bill. So just to keep the record clear, we are on Assembly Bill 355. Uh, anyone in the room in support of Assembly Bill 355? Not seeing anyone come forward. Is there, I'm seeing no one on Zoom. Is there anyone on the phone line in support of Assembly Bill 355? Broadcast services. Pardon me, Chair. 
If you would like to testify in support on AB 355, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the room in opposition to Assembly Bill 355? Seeing none, uh, seeing no one else on Zoom. Going to the phone line, is there anyone in support or opposition to Assembly Bill 355? If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 355, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the room in neutral? Seeing none, no one on Zoom. Broadcast services, is there anyone in neutral on the phone line, please? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 355, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in neutral. Okay, we have no one on the line in neutral, so I would invite those other folks in neutral who have proposed conceptual amendments to this bill to come forward and propose their amendments to the committee. Good evening. I'll start with Ms. Adams. Good evening, Madam um, Chair and the members of this committee. I'm B.B. Adams, representing the Nevada Alliance of Boys and Girls Club. From Elko to Reno to Las Vegas and all different places in between, um, I respectfully submit this amendment to this bill asking for a $2 million appropriations for the clubs. The Boys and Girls Club stayed open all last year, providing a safe place for over 10,000 kids easing a burden to critical workers, knowing that their children were safe and cared for while they did their jobs. We continue to run programming such as Positive Action, STEM, and Summer Brain Gain. The clubs provided the means necessary for our kids to attend classes remotely and provided tutoring and playtime in this challenging environment. We also provided free meals for families that were struggling, and that practice continues today. This amendment will help the clubs continue our programming and requires us to report back to the Interim Finance Committee about how these monies are spent. We appreciate your support of the clubs and ask for your consideration of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Are there any questions from the committee members at this time of Ms. Adams? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Ms. Fisher, in neutral. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano speaking this evening on behalf of Nevada Blind Children's Foundation. I would also mention that we do have waiting on the phone the CEO of, of Nevada Blind Children's Foundation, Emily Smith, in case there are some questions that I may not be able to answer. Um, we are respectfully requesting um, an appropriation of $1 million for capital expenses. We are in the, the middle of a, a $5 million capital campaign to expand services in Nevada for, for children ages birth to 22 years who are blind and or visually impaired. It includes a $3.2 million purchase of our current location, which thankfully we have just completed. It's a 12,000 square foot school facility in Henderson, and we have $800,000 planned in capital improvements, life skills training, accessible pro, uh, playground, et cetera, and then building maintenance fund. And I will tell you that this investment in Nevada kids saves Nevada money in the long run. We estimate it saves probably, if we can teach these children and young adults life skills and work skills and help get them into different services also for workforce training, it saves Nevada a million dollars per person over that person's life because of they're able to be self-supporting. So this is an investment in Nevada's future that pays off in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. And if you could go ahead and have the person from the school go ahead and just give us a few remarks. I believe they're on the phone line. So broadcast services, if um, 
And, and the name again, Ms. Fisher? Her name is Emily Smith, and the last three digits of her number um, are 329. Broadcast services, if you could unmute the last three numbers of 329 for us, please. Chair, this is broadcast. There is no one on the line with the last three digits, 329. Um, what was the name? I can ask them to raise their hand specifically. Emily Smith. If Emily Smith is on the call, please raise your hand now by pressing star nine. I'm not sure if this is the right person, Chair, but they did raise their hand, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute them. We'll take our chance. <laughs> All right. Hi, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. This is Emily Smith with Nevada Blind Children Foundation. Um, as uh, Susan mentioned that, yes, we did receive the first appropriation uh, just two years ago of a million dollar investment and little did we know just how important that would be during COVID. Uh, we too remained open during that time and have been providing on-site uh, learning for all of our students. And just imagine if you will, being the parent of a student who's blind or visually impaired and having them be sent home to learn and you don't know braille, you don't know adaptive technology um, and or you have a child who has never used any of that adaptive technology and now has to access their education in a different way. Uh, so we provided uh, teachers of the visually impaired and specialists uh, for our students throughout the year. And I'm pleased to say that our protocols kept our students safe. We had no um, transmission of COVID on site here as well. And so, as we mentioned, um, just a few quick statistics for you. Nevada is one of seven states that doesn't have a designated school for the blind. And so that's kind of where our foundation fits in is to meet that need and to work with the Clark County School District to provide additional support services. We are home of the only special needs licensed preschool in the state of Nevada. And um, our purpose is really to change some, some sad statistics that we have. Only 37% of, um, of visually impaired adults uh, have a high school diploma and about 36.6% of visually impaired adults uh, have full-time employment in our state. And so our purpose is really to get our kids prepared so that they can uh, you know, lead a fulfilled life in our, in our community. And so what we do is called expanded core curriculum. It's very specific to um, blind and visually impaired individuals and it attaches to common core curriculum. So it includes things like career education, orientation and mobility, like white train, uh, white cane training, um, independent living skills, assistive technology, um, compensatory access to their education, communication modes, things like that. And so our goal is to start early and provide a comprehensive um, suite of services for our students and their families that prepare them to um, lead an independent and fulfilled life. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith, for being available this evening. So with that, um, Ms. Fisher, anyone else? Or that's great. Thank you very much. So we have a proposed amendment there. Good evening. Introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, Chauncey Chow Duong on behalf of the Las Vegas Valley Water District. Uh, I've been in front of your committee before, Madam Chair, so I will keep my remarks short and sweet. Um, in short, we have submitted a conceptual amendment uh, of $2 million that will allow us to construct uh, an ethno-botanical garden at the Springs Preserve. Um, this is a community-assisted effort to develop an interpretive experience for Springs Preserve guests that introduces them to the cultural uses of desert flora as as it relates to the indigenous peoples of Nevada and will rely heavily on the development of community partnerships with local Southern Nevada tribes to help guide the implementation of this garden. Um, we believe that by educating the community on local ecology, planting and gardening strategies, and the spiritual relationship between indigenous peoples and the environment, we can help increase our connection and involvement in conservation efforts in Southern Nevada. Uh, we thank the committee for allowing us to testify on this bill and on behalf of the 300,000 visitors and 30,000 school children who visit the preserve on an annual basis, we would appreciate its support. I do have one of my archeologists by the name of Nathan Harper on the phone if there are any additional questions. Thank you. And thank you, uh, no questions there, but um, being familiar with the preserve, uh, could you describe approximately where the garden will be? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chauncey Chowdown for the record. So uh, if, um, 
you know, we have a variety of kind of areas where we're looking at. Um, we have there's a current Native American scene there that we might uh, supplement with uh, this area. It's near the Origin Museum, uh, and we're looking at a variety of other places too. Um, I would uh, anticipate that the two million dollars given to us would allow us to complete the entire construction of the ethnobotanical garden. Okay, thank you very much. And you are considered a national botanical. You ha you have botanical correct. garden designation. Correct. Now, correct. We do. That's correct. All right. Any questions from any committee members at this time? Seeing none, all right, thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate that. Is there anyone else wishing to come forward in neutral on Assembly 355 at this current time? Not seeing anyone, then I believe um, the hearing, we can go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 355. I do know that there was conversations with some other groups. They were not able to attend this evening We'll continue those conversations as we move forward, and, but we do know that there is a time frame involved, so we'll, we'll be sure and address that at the appropriate time. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 355, but as I stated earlier, we will go ahead and open up the hearing on, I've lost my notes, 447, thank you. So if the folks for 447 could come forward, please. Good evening. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on 447. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Shane Piccinini, um, and I am a founding uh, board member of the Nevada Center for Civic Education. And um, I promise that I will not let this go into the wee hours of tomorrow, but I just wanna say that the Nevada Center for Civic Education is an organization that has been a long time in the making. Uh, you know us first and foremost for the We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution program that we run, but that's not the only thing we do. We also have the Project Citizen program, um, and. Assemblywoman Teresa Benitez Thompson may be familiar with that program because in 2017 we brought a bill forward with a social worker intern um, that we use that curriculum for. And then uh, we also have the Nevada History Project, we have Law Day, and then once again, when it's safe for people to enter into the schools, I would like to bring back the legislators in the classroom program where we connect uh, you with the schools in your district. Uh, elementary through high school to give you an opportunity to talk about what you do and more importantly remind the students that you know lawmaking and the legislature is not this big scary thing um, so we have really grown this program over the years um, you know it started out in the beginning with federal funding through the United States Congress we're hoping that we might be able to get some of that back in the future uh, and then we moved over to the state bar and then eventually we created the Nevada Center, which really is actually a better move for us. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Andy and he can give you some additional details. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Good evening, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, uh, Andrew McKay actually appearing in front of you and is in my capacity as treasurer of uh, the Nevada Center for Civic Engagement. Um, really brief history and I'll be quick. Um, because it's getting late. Uh, I'm a proud alumnus of this program uh, over a quarter century ago. Uh, I sat actually at, I believe, this table and, uh, and competed. Um, in, in short, uh, in 2019, the legislature generously provided much needed funding uh, to the center to enable us to grow the We the People competition. Uh, many of you that I'm looking at right now uh, either have children uh, that have uh, participated in it or have judged the competitions. Um, and um, I, I, I think the uh, proof is in the pudding. Uh, just to give you a couple real quick things in terms of what, what, what this funding went to, and, and is, you could look back at the report that we provided uh, IFC pursuant to the provisions of the appropriation from last session. But just to give you an idea, um, training the teachers uh, in, in order to educate them on this, on this program and to get it into the classroom and uh, into the students' uh, brains and psyches. Um, eight teachers, uh, we were there to facilitate the Summer Institute, 
uh, where 67 new teachers uh, were teached in the curriculum. Uh, with respect to coordinator uh, stipends, those are the uh, in individuals that donate a ton of time, and they are the, the gears that uh, make this bus move forward. They make sure everything is uh, running on time. But most importantly, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize Kathleen Dickinson. Uh, she's on the Zoom. I'll turn it over to her because she's honestly the brains behind this. We're just the board. Uh, our, our job is easy, uh, to be honest. And, and Kathleen can certainly um, explain a little bit more. But uh, if we did not get that appropriation, and I don't think this is hyperbolic in the, in, in the least in 2019, what you have seen in growing and expanding this program across the state, literally in all corners, from McDermott to Henderson to Reno to Elko, it, 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 it does not happen uh, w without legislative support from 2019. And uh, we implore you, beg, plead, grovel, uh, that you'll be able to give us uh, the same thing this go around. And uh, before I shut up, uh, Madam Chair, you're going to be missed. So, thank you very much. So, with that, Ms. Dickinson, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would just like to add to my board members that this program was able to run through COVID. We were able to attain Canvas and Zoom platforms and all kinds of virtual platforms because of the funding that you gave us. So throughout COVID, we were able to hold trainings, provide competitions. We were able to go to McDermott and do virtual in-classroom hearings. Uh, we have gone to West Wendover. We've been all over the state. And it's a wonderful program for teaching 21st century skills of communication, confidence, all kinds of critical thinking, analysis, and it's a very important and crucial program for teaching civics, current events, and how it correlates to the U.S. Constitution, as well as to the Nevada Constitution. So I am available for questions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all the work that you do and to being able to keep providing the, the services um, throughout the pandemic that we had. We, we, I know that probably took a lot of effort. Thank you. We appreciate that. So with that, committee members, are there any questions at this time? Assemblywoman Tolls, I was waiting for you to raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair, and um, really more of a comment, I think, than anything. Um, my daughter changed schools just so she could be a part of the We the People program she transferred in her junior year and then COVID hit and she was able to still participate um, over this past year, what would have been in her senior year an extremely uh, depressing time for a particularly social young lady. Um, we the people kept her going through the summer, through the fall and just recently a few weeks ago, I'm proud to say that uh, her school um, broke the barrier, one third in the nation. And um, we have never, in the state of Nevada, made it into the top five. And you have literally changed her life. So I just want to say thank you for what this program does and what you've done for these students, especially for what has been an extremely difficult year for our students and um, how you've engaged them and how we've sent two teams from Incline and Reno High to nationals and they ranked eighth and third place. And we should be extremely proud of this program and of the lives that you've changed through it. So I just had to say thank you on the record. Thank you very much, Ms. Assemblywoman Tolls. With that, any other questions or comments from committee members at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is the hearing for Assembly Bill 477. So I'll go ahead and open up the hearing. Is there anyone in the room in support of Assembly Bill 477? Hearing none. In the room, uh, no one on Zoom. We'll go to broadcast services. Is there anyone on the phone line in support of Assembly Bill 477? 
If you would like to testify in support on AB 477, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one on the line to testify in support at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in opposition in the room? Seeing none, no one on Zoom. Is there any opposition on the phone? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 477, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Oh, AB 447, I apologize. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone in neutral in the room on Assembly Bill 447? Seeing no one come forward, no one on Zoom. Anyone in neutral? Uh, broadcast services on the phone line. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 477, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, I believe, um, I don't think there's any closing comments that need to be made. I believe we can go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 447. And with that, we'll go back to our order. The next bill that we have is Assembly Bill 371. Good evening, Ms. Miller. P please proceed. Thank you so much. Good evening, um, Chair Carlton and members of the committee. For the record, I am Brittany Miller and I represent Assembly District 5. Um, to present AB 371 in its briefest capacity, what it does is it requires that if a student makes a claim of a racist act that was done at school, that it be investigated in the same exact matter according to the existing bullying protocols that are already in place in school. With that, there were originally fiscal notes that were placed on the bill, but per the amendment that was adopted in the assembly before it was voted out of committee, all of those fiscal notes have since been removed. And with that, I'm open for questions. And thank you, Ms. Miller. Have you provided the documentation on the removal of the fiscal notes to the committee staff? In some cases, some of the um, Fiscal notes, the, the districts and uh, went ahead and did an unsolicited one. So it's up on Nellis where it has it zeroed out. And in other cases, they're still working on it, but I do have emails from everyone. If you could please forward those emails to myself and to committee staff to make sure that we can attach them to the bill as it moves forward. It's always good to have it in writing and have it attached. Thank Absolutely. you very much. So with that committee members, are there any questions of Ms. Miller at this time? Seeing no other questions, thank you very much, Ms. Miller. So this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 371. We'll go ahead and open it up for those in support. Is there any support in the room, please? Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Annette Magnus. I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. I am here in support of AB 371 and thank Assemblywoman Miller for this important bill by investing in legislation. This committee will help bring solutions to racially motivated bullying and discrimination in schools. Too much of that is happening, so wherever we can do, whatever we can do to address it is worth every penny. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in support in the room? Seeing none, see when no one on Zoom. Is there any support on the phone lines? If you would like to testify in support on AB 371, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 419. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Carlton. Uh, for the record, my name is Benjamin Chalnor. That's B E N J A M I N C H A L L I N O R. And I am the Policy Director for Faith in Action Nevada. I would like to echo the sentiments um, and the comments made by uh, the previous previous testifier. Um, we'd like to thank Assemblywoman uh, Brittany Miller for bringing this bill. 
as someone who experienced uh, racial bullying uh, growing up in our schools, um, this is a very important bill uh, to make sure that um, other kids in our school system don't experience this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in support on the phone line? Caller with the last three digits, 710. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, caring committee members. My name is Maria Nieto Orta, spelled M A R I A, last name N I E C O, space O R T A. I just want to say, uh, Mi Familia Vota Nevada is in full support of AB 371 and want to thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this uh, bill forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else in support on the phone, please? For those of you that have just joined the call, if you would like to testify in support on AB 371, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll go to opposition. Is there any opposition in the room? Seeing none come forward, no one on Zoom. Is there any opposition on the phone line? If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 371, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in neutral in the room to testify? Seeing none, no one on Zoom. Is there anyone on the phone line in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 371, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 247, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. We will have two minutes and may begin. Caller 247, please press star 6 to unmute. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I apologize. I was trying to get into support. Can I still testify, Chair? You sure can. Go ahead. That's fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erica Castro, E-R-I-K-A-C-A-S. TRO. I am with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada and also testifying on behalf of the Nevada Immigrant Coalition in support of Assembly Bill 371. Our schools are meant to be safe learning environments, but they are not immune from racism and hate, which impacts students' ability to learn, their self-esteem, mental health, and feelings of safety at school. Racism is, is, is a learned behavior, and we must invest in actions to address it immediately in our schools. We urge you to pass AB 371 to support our students. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. So I believe we were in neutral broadcast service, because can you double check to make sure there's no one in neutral on the phone line, please? I have one person that raised their hand. I'll cue them up. Caller with the last three digits, 490. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. My name is Cyrus Sojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Uh, I think, yes, it's true, racism does exist. Um, However, I am concerned that this, not, this does not address all forms of non-European ethnic groups. I have not heard of how this is going to prevent uh, possible racism on people who originate from the Middle East and East Asia. And not to mention, keep in mind, that reverse racism can exist as well. Uh, people can be biased to people who are European descent as well. I think that any form of prejudice is absolutely wrong. And I believe one of the ways that we can handle it is we can give people the choice of whether they want to live in a diverse or a homogenous society. And that should be implemented all over the world. We thank you for bringing this issue very, very up. And I will yield my time. Broadcast services, is there anyone else in neutral? Caller, Chair, there are no more callers on the line at this time. 
Thank you very much. So with that, Ms. Miller, are there any closing comments? No closing comments from Ms. Miller. So with that, we can go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 371, and we can open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 376. I believe Ms. Torres is coming through the door as we speak. Good evening, Ms. Torres. Good evening. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 376. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Carlton. I, I will say I had my remarks originally to say good morning to the uh, to the committee, but good afternoon or good evening uh, to the members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, for the record, I am Assemblywoman Salana Torres, proudly representing Assembly District 3 in the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm here today to discuss the fiscal note implemented by AB 376. For the sake of the committee's time, I'll just dive right into the fiscal note. And for the purpose of today's presentation, I just want to remind the committee that we will be working off the second reprint of AB 376. The committee should note that the fiscal notes online are no longer applicable with the revisions to the bill as the bill has been significantly amended um, in the committee. The fiscal note right now pertains to the appropriation of $500,000 to the UNLV Immigration Clinic. The funds from AB 376 will be used to expand services in our community, most importantly to defend immigrant children and their families in deportation proceedings. At this time, I will defer to Assemblywoman Benita Thompson, who will provide some additional remarks. Majority Leader. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Assembly Ways and Means, and thank you to the bill sponsor, Assemblywoman Torres, because this has actually been a joy and a pleasure to work on, and I learned so much, and um, and I am quite excited about this, and so want to walk you through the fiscal note. You're going to see that you have a document that's uploaded from UNLV's Immigration Clinic, and the conversation with Ms. Torres was, how can we help our helpers? We have folks in the community who are doing really great great work who are providing uh, pro bono services to our immigrant community and we know we have populations in need so how do we help our helpers and the answer was get more support to the UNLV immigration clinic so had the the pleasure of talking with um, Mr. Kagan and working through the program and had great support and help from and she to make sure that um, we were walking through this uh, appropriately and how we were talking about cost and, and running through the cost. So you're gonna see on page one, a description of what the program is. And within this, you're gonna see um, a reference to the intent of what, what's going to happen. So we wanted to make it, sh make it clear that this is not going to pay for faculty positions because we've already funded those and we have already done that. Instead, what it's going to do is allow for new direct service provisions um, and uh, and so these positions will be able to help, for example, like a paralegal position with uh, people who directly defend immigrant children and their families. Additionally, what it's going to allow the UNLV Immigration Clinic to do is to potentially pull down dollars from the Immigrant Justice Corps to place entry-level attorneys and paralegals into this. And so that's a fellowship program where they take, I'll call them new baby lawyers, they take new fellows in and they house them there. And then these are smart, amazing graduates doing fellowship work to come in and work with this population. Um, when you look at page two and you start working through what the fiscal note is, you can see that and we've got the cost for year one. It'll be identical for year two. And you can see we've laid out the, the they've laid out the payroll cost, rent, utility, litigation expenses, and insurance coverage, um, staff development, professional P professional fees for $250,000 in the first year. It would be those same costs in the second year. That's where you're getting the total $500,000 appropriation. But the, you can also see below about the additional impact from that investment. Um, and you can see how those dollars are coming in as well. And so we believe this is um, the smart, a smart use of money. We think it's an exciting use of money. Um, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kagan. Good evening, Mr. Kagan. Please proceed. My name is Michael Kagan. I'm the director of the UNLV Immigration Clinic. Um, I'm really grateful to uh, Chair Carlton um, and uh, to Assemblywoman Torres for sponsoring this bill and to 
Majority Leader Benitez Thompson um, uh, for backing this and for supporting what we do at the UNLV Immigration Clinic. I realize, and I've been told many times, this is ways and means. I would love to spend a very long time talking about the great work that we do in the clinic and uh, especially about our clients and why this work matters. I'll try to get as quickly as possible to the numbers. Um, I want to st state clearly that uh, in terms of our role in the community and particularly for immigrants and, and for mixed families um, in Nevada, um, what makes us unique is our focus on deportation defense. Um, I usually tell people you don't want to have us as your lawyer because I don't want you to be in that position. But when your back is against the wall and, and when um, people are facing deportation, um, we are typically, literally for people in immigration detention, often the only phone number they can call, um, especially if they don't have means. And the vast majority of people in immigration detention don't have the means to hire a lawyer and nor do unaccompanied children. So um, we focus on those two areas, de uh, detain people in ICE immigration detention and unaccompanied children. Children are our largest group of clients. We have had, uh, most of our child clients have been middle school or high school age, but we have had clients as young as three when they first walked in the door. And again, um, that's not something law school prepares you for very well. Uh, that's not a normal kind of, of client, um, but those children are victims of violence in their countries and often of child abuse as well. Um, the number you should realize before I get to the budget numbers is four out of five or 80%. Um, in data at the Las Vegas Immigration Court going back to 2001, when people have lawyers, four out of five times they avoid deportation, which shows that just because they're in immigration court does not mean that people need to be deported. But when people don't have lawyers, four out of five times they are ordered deported. The exact opposite. And that's why it's so essential to make sure that the most vulnerable people have um, lawyers in this process. Um, the uh, why is this a, a matter for the state? The reason is, is that these cases cost the state money. When someone from Nevada is deported, uh, that means that a family loses a breadwinner. That means a child loses a parent. That means that children are more likely to go into foster care. That means that schools may have additional need costs for interventions to help that family. And I hope I, for the sake of, of child, child safety, that is ultimately the state's responsibility. And that's why it's important for us to do that work. Um, when we are successful, particularly for say an adult in immigration detention, we are often able to get people out of detention and permission to work legally. And that means that they will be self-sufficient. It also means they'll pay taxes. Um, a similar program to ours uh, in New York City generated more than $1 million in tax, in new tax revenue by helping people be able to work legally who otherwise would have been detained, um, making a family dependent. Now, um, the last thing I want to cover is what we'll do, although Majority Leader uh, Benitez Thompson has always, already covered that quite well. Um, this would be a foundational uh, and transformative um, uh, investment from the state in our work. It would be the beginning of something bigger. We would open a, a new community advocacy office off campus that is more accessible to the community. Um, and uh, most of the expenses would be used to uh, hire two new staff members. And by doing that, we believe we can leverage that with our partnership with Immigrant Justice Corps, um, who are aware of this initiative right now, to bring in two additional lawyers uh, and that's just at the beginning. And we hope over time that this, this will, again, will will be able to grow. So the uh, 500,000 investment over two years might be more like $900,000 in impact. So um, in closing, um, this is essential for the community in which we live, for the fam for our, uh, our neighbors, um, and generally for the, um, the value that when um, someone's family is in jeopardy, they should not stand alone. Um, and I'll, I'll close there, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and for the opportunity to talk about our work at the UNLV Immigration Clinic. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from committee members at this time? Not seeing any questions? Assemblywoman Tolls. Sorry, I feel like I'm so chatty tonight. I promise I'll try and keep it short. I just, um, thank you, Chair. I, I'm just curious. It, reading through the bill, it, it seems like so much of this would fit under the Office of New Americans. So I'm just wondering why we're 
creating this under the office of the lieutenant governor and um, and then with the attorney general instead of putting it there. Thank you for the question. Um, through the chair to Assemblywoman Tolls, Assemblywoman Tories for the record. Um, so we had had conversations about putting it under the Office of New Americans. We decided it worked well under the lieutenant governor's office um, because not only did they have the staffing to ensure that we provided the task force um, and they had the means to start getting grants um, to establish this task force. But additionally, they do oversee small businesses. Um, and so a lot of this conversation is going to be about economic development and small businesses. Um, you will note that one of the members of the committee um, is appointed by the Office of New Americans and the governor. And I imagine that the Office of New Americans would be rather participatory. It's just we don't want to overextend their staffing. We have another uh, number of other pieces of legislation that's going to be putting more work um, for our Office of New Americans. And so so we want to make sure um, that what we're doing makes sense, but keeps them a part of the conversation. Thank you. Any other questions from any other community members at this time? Not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much, Majority Leader, Assemblywoman. With that, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 376. I'll go ahead and open it up for those in support of Assembly Bill 376. Please proceed. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Kanani Espinoza on behalf of the Nevada System of Higher Education. And she and UNLV would like to express their support and thanks the committee for um, listening to the presentation and the appropriation. Thank you. Please proceed. Good evening, committee. My name is Bruno Landivar, B-R-U-N-O-L-A-N-D-I-V-A-R. And I'm the intern for the Nevada Hispanic Legislative Caucus. On behalf of the caucus, I'd like to uh, issue our support for AB 376. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Anyone else in support, please proceed. Good evening. My name is Jillian Block. That's G-I-L-L-I-A-N-B-L-O-C-K. Uh, and I'm here representing the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. Uh, the Legal Aid Center works closely with the UNLV Boyd School of Law Immigration Clinic. I'm also very proud to have worked as a student attorney in the immigration clinic, which was one of the most meaningful experiences of my law school career by far. Um, I just want to put our support on the record. Immigrants are an essential part of the fabric of our communities, and we support AB 376. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Wellborn, please. Good evening. Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada. I think what um, Ms. Block failed to say is that she has um, participated in the clinic as a student at the Boyd School of Law. It's been really incredible to see her legal journey, to see um, the lawyers that uh, enter our community as part of the UNLV Immigration Clinic. Um, it's a failure, it's a policy failure that we do not provide legal counsel, that we have not declared legal counsel a right in immigration proceedings. And you have an opportunity to take a step forward by passing this bill and appropriating these funds to this program. Um, we have our full support behind this and we thank Professor Kagan for um, his program the students in that program, the, the lawyers that he builds and develops because they're really the only line of defense that a lot of families have. Thank you. Apologize, thank you very much. Anyone else in the room in support? Not seeing anyone else in the room. No one on Zoom in support. So with that, we will go to the phone lines. Is there anyone on the phone in support? If you would like to testify in support on AB 376, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 710. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Dear chair and committee members, my name is Maria Nieto Orta, M-A-R-I-A -A, space N-I-E-T-O-O-R-C-A, and I am the co-chair of the Undocu Council. The Undocu Council is a subcommittee of the Nevada Immigrant Coalition, and we are in full support of AB 376. As mentioned before, the UNLV Immigration Clinic provides deportation defense to uh, CSN and UNLV students and, and their families. As someone who has been directly impacted by the financial burden of the long-lasting deportation defense proceedings, I urge the support of AB 376. Even during the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, families have, not, have suffered and deportation has not been halted throughout it. We ask the committee to fully support AB 376, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else on the phone line in support, please?
Caller with the last three digits, 031. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Dear Chair and Committee members, my name is Jocelyn Guevas, J-O-S-E-L-I-N-E, Guevas, C-U-E-V-A-S, and I am an organizer at Mi Bota. Mi Familia Bota Nevada is proud to support AB 76. We also want to thank Assemblywoman Torres for and all the sponsors for the bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else in support on the phone, please? Caller with the last three digits, 796. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair Carlton, members of the committee. My name is Melody Hudilia. That is M-E-L-O-D-Y-J-U-D-I-L-L-A. And I am Deputy Director for Silver State Voices. We are in strong support of AB 376. We especially support the appropriation to the UNLV Immigration Clinic to provide pro bono work for directly impacted people. At Silver State Voices, we believe in putting marginalized and impacted people at the forefront, and this bill will provide the resources to do just that. We ask you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in support, please? Caller with the last three digits, one, three, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. And I'm the Policy Director for the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada, also testifying on behalf of the Nevada Immigrant Coalition in support of Assembly Bill 376. We will just ditto the previous remarks and urge your support of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in support, please? Caller with the last three digits, 517. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller 517, please press star six to unmute. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Rico Ocampo, spelled R-I-C-O, space O-C-A-M-P-O. I am with Make the Road Nevada. Today, I am testifying on behalf of our members in support of AB 376. We know that in Nevada's immigration court, there's no federal government-provided public defender system, even for unaccompanied children fleeing violence. Ultimately, it is for uh, a judge to decide what happens to each case in immigration court, but a fair decision cannot be reached when only one side is properly represented. Denying legal services to those that may need them the most contradicts our bedrock values of due process and fairness. And public resources invested in immigrant legal defense go back into the community, including into local tax revenues and reduce the cost of separating families. For example, a study in New York City found that immigrant legal defense led many more people to obtain legal appointments which generated new tax revenue for local governments. By investing in equal access to due process, deportation defense advances a more equitable vision of justice. It is why I urge this committee to support AB 376. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just about at the end of support, so I'm going to take one more, and if there are any others on the phone line, then I would like to ask them to just submit their support in writing to be included in the record. So with that, is there anyone else in support? Chair, this is the last caller in the queue. Thank you. Caller at the last three digits, 419. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Benjamin Chalinor, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-C-H-A-L-L-I-N-O-R. I'm the Policy Director for Faith in Action Nevada, and I uh, would like to say ditto. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So with that, uh, we've done support. Is there anyone in opposition in the room? Seeing no one in opposition, no one in opposition on Zoom. Is there any opposition on the phone line, please? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 376, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 490. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me here. My name is Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. 
As far as I know, this is just a taxpayer funding services for unauthorized immigrants, people who have failed to follow our immigration law. I was told that these folks are not a burden to our country. However, this bill proves otherwise. This bill, although it shows that people who fail to follow our immigration laws, and yes, I understand that the process is very tough. Both of my parents came here as immigrants with lawyers and everything. However, it is unfair to the people who have followed the law just like them. This also brings the incentive for more people, given the fact that we have a border crisis, to come in and bring their children and the problem will continue to grow. Instead, what we should be doing is we should be auditing and finding employers to find out where these people are employed. And we also have to make sure to fight against birthright citizenship, which Harry Reid was against in 1993, which prevented these families from separating. This means that there's a lot of jobs that are offered to American citizens, not to mention the welfare burden, which their children can get, is gone down, and schools are less likely to be crowded. And I also believe remittances should be taxed as well. We appreciate the efforts that are trying to help and serve the community. We understand that jailing and deportation is tough. However, it should be done more effectively. But worst of all, I believe the goal is not to serve the community, but it's to pursue a political agenda to basically get long-term outcomes and politicians in and serve the benefits of Wall Street. We have seen similar efforts in the state of California in many cities. And guess what? Taxes are sky high. I do not want to see Nevada become another California in so many different ways. I've lived there for 25 years, and you can see companies fleeing. So other than that, this is giving more tax If you could wrap up, please, your two minutes failed. have expired. Please wrap up. Fail to follow our immigration law, and I urge you all to vote for vote no on this bill. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Is there anyone else in opposition on the line, please? Caller with the last three digits, 196. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good late evening, Chairwoman Carlton, and members of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. I'm Eric Spratley, S-P-R-A-T-L-E-Y, from the Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. The Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs support Nevada's immigrant workers and all of our Nevada residents, taxpayers, and businesses. We do not oppose the task force or any appropriation, but do oppose the potential of an unfunded mandate created by Section 20.6 in AB 376, the second revision on Nellis, that requires law enforcement agencies to adopt model policies created by the Attorney General. While these policies might possibly end up being applicable policies for every Nevada law enforcement agency, and there are hundreds. Each Nevada law enforcement jurisdiction is different and unique. Law enforcement leaders across Nevada are elected or appointed by the people of that jurisdiction, and as such, their local law enforcement operations have policies which reflect how those Nevada residents want their jurisdictions to function. There are no fiscal notes applicable to this section as there is no way to determine how many policies may come out of this endeavor. But adopting policies is not something as simple as copying and pasting onto an agency letterhead. It takes personnel hours and legal evaluation at the local level to make sure a policy can be implemented appropriately. Even if the local law enforcement agencies choose not to adopt the policy per the provision in section 20.6.2b, the personnel hours and most likely the legal evaluation must still be done to ensure the law enforcement agency is on good footing to make that determination. To avoid this future potential of an unfunded mandate, we oppose Assembly Bill 376, reprint 2. And this committee has yet to support our position on anything, but we thought we'd get it on the record anyway. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Spratley, but I don't think you need to call out the committee or make it personal. The committee works on issues and brings things to a vote, and that's how the process works. Thank you very much. So with that, broadcast services, is there anyone else in opposition on the phone line? Call with the last three digits, 859. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. 
Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Janine Hansen, J-A-N-I-N-E-H-A-N-S-E-N. I am the state chairman of the Independent American Party. AB 376 includes an appropriation for $500,000 to the Void School of Law to pay legal fees for illegal aliens to be paid for by taxpayers. Nevada taxpayers already pay exorbitant taxes to support illegal aliens. Fair estimates the annual fiscal burden on Nevada taxpayers associated with illegal immigration to be about $630 million. That was in 2008. This equates to an annual average cost of about $763 per native-born headed household in the state of Nevada. In addition, there is a cost to the state's economy resulting from remittances sent abroad that amounted to $618 million in 2006. According to the Center for Immigration Studies, 62% of households headed by illegal immigrants used one or more welfare programs. Originally, AB 376 contained honest language restricting law enforcement from all cooperation with federal immigration. Although that portion of the bill was amended out, the current bill will do the same thing but behind the backs of Nevadans by having the Attorney General publish model policies for limiting to the fullest extent possible immigration enforcement. This is nothing but a stealth sanctuary state bill protecting illegal aliens and jeopardizing the safety of Nevadans. AB 376 also creates a deceptively named task force to keep Nevada working for illegal aliens. What about citizens, legal citizens of Nevada who are out of work and have lost their jobs and businesses during this emergency? The task force will be made up of illegal alien friendlies, including immigration, advocacy groups, labor unions, legal interests, and faith-based and advocacy, which focuses on immigration and criminal justice. Who will represent the interests of Nevada taxpayers and other working Nevadans? Please vote no on AB 376, Sanctuary State Legislation. Thank you. Uh, Next caller in opposition, please. Call it at the last three digits, 105. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening. My name is Lynn Chapman. I'm the state treasurer of the Independent American Party, L-Y-N-N-C-H-A-P-M-A-N. We should be using our state's resources and tax dollars for Nevada citizens, especially with the pandemic problems we've had for over a year. Americans have lost their jobs, businesses, and sometimes even their homes. And now we're looking at taking even more money from the taxpayers to spend on defending people who are in our country illegally. You want us to pay for a task force to keep America working, which does not include Americans, but only includes people from all around the world here illegally in our country. This is an offense. This is offensive, especially to all Nevadans who are struggling. How much more money in the future will be needed for this and more programs for illegals? This is not a good bill for taxpayers or Nevadans. Please oppose AB 376. Thank you. Next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in neutral in the room? Seeing no one and no one on Zoom, is there any neutral on the phone line? If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 376, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one on the line to testify in neutral. Thank you very much. So with that, Ms. Torres, Majority Leader, any closing comments? Thank you, Assemblyman Torres, for the record. I'm going to keep my closing remarks brief um, because I'm sure you would like to move on to the next piece of legislation. I just want to clarify that, um, one, there is no fiscal note on the implementation of the task force because the Lieutenant Governor's Office will be seeking grants um, to run that. Additionally, uh, for the portion related to the Attorney General uh, working with local law enforcement, I just want to make the record abundantly clear that in Section 20.6 of the legislation, sub 
to B, it does give law, local law enforcement agencies the ability to opt out from adopting the model policies. Um, but you know, over the recent months, we've seen local law enforcement agencies asking, even in interviews um, in the media, um, for there to be model policies and you know expressing distress that there was no model policies. And so this would give the opportunity for them to create model policies, and local law enforcement agencies can choose to adopt those if it's so appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Torres. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 376, and I'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 382 and invite Mr. Watts to the table. And Mr. Watts, as a member of the committee, you know the game plan, so we're going to go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 382. Thank you very much. Good night, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Howard Watts representing District 15 in Clark County. Uh, Assembly Bill 382 briefly establishes the Student Loan Bill of Rights. And essentially what it does is it both establishes some affirmative rights for student borrowers located within the state, uh, as well as practices that student loan servicers uh, must abide by. And in order to provide um, an enforcement and kind of regulatory mechanism around that, uh, it uh, creates a licensing structure within the Financial Institutions Division of the Department of Business and Industry. Uh, so that is the, the high-level version of the bill. There are a few provisions that also relate to um, uh, other uh, educational institutions which involve the Commission on Post-Secondary Education. Those are the two primary fiscal notes that uh, the committee will see. Uh, I'll just indicate that uh, following the uh, adoption of the amendment, so the first reprint, which all members should have a copy of, the uh, FID submitted an unsolicited updated fiscal note that also includes projected revenues um, as well as where the expenses and revenues would balance out to. Uh, and then uh, I will also just briefly note that uh, you should have on your desks a, a conceptual amendment that I have proposed uh, after talking with uh, the Commission on Post-Secondary Education. I believe we have Ms. West uh, available by Zoom to provide additional um, details if requested. Essentially what this does is adjust some of the fee schedules related to the Commission um, in alignment with uh, particularly Colorado which has a similar uh, regulatory structure in order to mitigate the ongoing costs uh, in the Commission's uh, submitted fiscal note. Uh, and then uh, the other major item that they had was an IT project and I just wanted to note for the committee that uh, that project actually was uh, approved in the 2019 legislature. It was something that uh, we had to remove in uh, 2020 as a budget reduction measure, and then it was not included in the uh, recommended budget for this biennium. Um, but it was something it was something that was previously identified as a need for our state. So with that, I'll uh, conclude and happy to take any questions that you have. Any questions of Mr. Watts at this time? Not seeing any, we'll go to Ms. West. Did you have some comments? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, for the record, Kelly Wiest, uh, K-E-L-L-Y-W-U-E-S-T. I am the Administrator for the Commission on Post-Secondary Education. Um, we had uh, spoke to Assemblyman Watts about how we could offset some of these costs. Um, our first year projections for revenue um, equal $124,000. And uh, that will reduce down the cost to $395,073. And in the second year, our projections will actually give us a positive result of $4,445 uh, above what the cost will be to operate the program. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from any committee members at this time? Uh, Mr. Haven. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, how are the, the fees um, developed? Um, we have a normal fee structure every year. I, I'm required to give a projection uh, budgetarily, and uh, they're based on our historical numbers. 
and um, uh, some of the areas where we're dividing out uh, the per student fee cost, I'm able to determine what fee was paid by a college and university versus a, a uh, non-college degree program. And so we were able to use our, our current data to come up with these numbers. And if I may, Assemblyman Watts for the record. Uh, and it, it, I don't know if what you meant was how was the proposed uh, fee schedule developed and Ms. Weiss may be able to elaborate on that as well, but essentially it was um, looking at uh, what structures exist in some some other states, as well as looking what at uh, how uh, implementing some of those various structures that we've seen in other areas could be used to essentially balance out the costs, uh, so that there wasn't a need for an additional general fund appropriation. Mr. Haven, any other questions at this time? No? Assemblywoman Tolles. Thank you, Chair. And, and um, we've had some good discussions about this uh, legislation. I did have some concerns initially when we sat down. Uh, the first time you introduced this with the fees, and, um, and we talked about how that was you know, standard for this, but I noticed in the amendment we're doubling the fees. And so I, could you just expand on why we we doubled them, is that purely to get rid of the fiscal note or to reduce the fiscal note? Because those are substantially more. Thank you for that question, Simone and Tolles. Howard Watts for the record. Uh, I'd like to defer to Ms. Weiss. Uh, she has some additional background on uh, some of these various fees. Many of them have not been updated in some time and that factors into some of the decisions for some of the uh, adjustments. Again, uh, one of the other considerations was trying to find a way to allow the commission to be self-sustaining um, without needing to bring in additional general fund dollars. And so once we had the proposal, I wanted to bring it before the committee for your consideration. Um, Kelly Weiss for the record. Um, the only fee that we have that actually has doubled is the uh, initial application for license licensure. And um, Nevada actually has more applications than, than other agencies of our size across the United States. Um, how we plan to offset this is um, for the small business owner, they may open up a, you know, a, a, a very small school that ha will have less than 100 people. We uh, plan on going back to the uh, Nevada Administrative Code and changing some of the requirements for the, uh, the CPA reviewer audited financials and give them options to provide tax records and do some other statements and not have that burden of expense, which ranges from about $2,500 to about $5,000. So for the small business, they'll actually come out ahead in the long run. And colleges and universities, which obviously have uh, more resources, would be able to pay the additional cost. Um, for the other areas, uh, there are a couple of new proposed areas. One of them is in the experiential learning category. Uh, right now, a, an institution that operates outside of the state of Nevada um, pays a one-time fee. Uh, they don't pay any other fees, and we do have to maintain that license. And this would uh, create a charge where they would have a renewal um, and uh, offset some of those costs. Ms. Tolles, no follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you for the answer. Quick committee, other questions at this time? Not seeing any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Watts. With that, this is the hearing, so we'll go ahead and open it up for, for public testimony. So do we have anyone here in support of Assembly Bill 382? Seeing no one in the room in support, no one on Zoom. Is there anyone on the phone line? in support of Assembly Bill 382. If you would like to testify in support on AB 382, please slowly state and pardon me, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Um, in the room, do we have anyone in opposition? Seeing no one come forward. Oh, in opposition, Ms. Fisher. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano representing both Sally May and Discover um, Financial Services. And our opposition is actually more on the policy side, so I apologize, but I just did want to get it on the record that we do oppose the bill. Um, we do feel that there could be some negative impact to borrowers. Um, down the road, there were going to be some increased costs to them, and also there may be uh, fewer services available to them because of the additional um, language that is going in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other opposition in the room? Seeing none, no opposition on Zoom. Is there any opposition on the phone line? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 382, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 092, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller, you are unmuted on our end. Is it possible your phone is muted? Can you hear zero. me now? I apologize. There you uh, go. Yes, we can hear you. I work for Discover Financial Services. Thank you, Chair Carlson and committee members. Every year, Discover makes hundreds of private student loans in Nevada, and our total default rate across the country is less than 1%. Discover opposes AB 382 in its current form. Um, the current language exempts only federally chartered banks, though Discover shares many of the federal regulators with those banks. And if AB 382 is enacted, Discover will no longer be able to lend to Nevada families because we cannot meet a notification requirement in the bill. The cost to Nevada if Discover can no longer lend in the state will be other players entering the market, some without the vigorous state and federal regulations that Discover has. Um, some of you may have heard that the language in AB 382 has been passed in a dozen other states. That's not factual. In fact, the states of Virginia, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Colorado, all democratically led state legislatures, have amended their legislation with the necessary exemptions that Discover needs to be able to continue to work in those states, and we've supported those bills. Assemblyman Watt was kind to meet with us, and we've provided him language that has a very simple fix to AB 382. We're happy to share that language with each of you as well, and thank you for your consideration tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. With that, we can go on to the next caller in opposition, please. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in neutral in the room? Seeing no one in neutral. Uh, Mr. Sewell, are you here for this bill or is it in the next bill? Uh, for this bill, Madam Chair, uh, for the record, uh, Christopher Sewell, Chief Operating Officer at Dieter. I just want to uh, be really fast and uh, thank uh, Assemblyman Watts for working with Dieter and especially our Commission on Post-Secondary Education uh, on this bill. And that's all I wanted to say. Just a big thank you. And uh, we'll hopefully get out of here a little sooner. Thank you very much, Mr. Sewell. Is there anyone? Broadcast services open the phone line for those in neutral, please. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 382, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Watts, any closing comments, please, briefly? Thank you. I will be very brief. And Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for your consideration. Uh, just a brief note, in opposition, I've talked with... Uh, Sally May and Discover and a couple of entities about their concerns. I believe wholeheartedly that the provisions of this bill um, should apply to everyone. And so there have been some folks that have come seeking to be carved out of the legislation. Uh, I welcome any uh, technical changes. In fact, some of the, the pieces that were referenced, we actually tried to model the legislation around best practices from uh, Sally May and uh, not to put any additional requirements on entities such as Discover. And so if there's actually language that will clarify those provisions to make sure that those things line up, I continue to welcome that and we'll continue to work with, uh, uh, with folks that may have any concerns. And uh, thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much. With that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 382. And Mr. Watts, stay right there. You've got the next one, I believe. Right. Assembly Bill 411. Oh, no, I apologize. I had your name on it, but I was wrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am happy to turn this bill presentation over to Mr. Watts, if you'd prefer. That's quite all right. So with that, we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 411. Welcome, Assemblywoman. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, I appreciate your time and energy this evening and for taking the time to hear Assembly Bill 411. For the record, my name is Tracy Brown May. I am the Assemblywoman representing Assembly District 42 in the heart of Clark County. The policy of the, this bill enables the sale of E15 gasoline in Nevada, which is currently restricted. The fiscal note was placed on the bill because of the original date provisions for the enaction of this piece of legislation. It was amended before it came out of committee, now enacted July 1, 2022, and as a result, the fiscal note was removed. The original fiscal note was placed by Administrator Greg Lovato, um, and you will see in Nellis, he has uploaded a, a letter um, identifying that there is no longer a fiscal impact to this legislation. Thank you very much. We always need to verify to make sure that all the paperwork is appropriate. So are there any questions for the Assemblywoman? Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much for your brevity. We appreciate it. It is the hearing for Assembly Bill 411. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone here in support of Assembly Bill 411? Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. Matt Walker on behalf of the New Fuels Alliance. Just want to thank uh, Assemblywoman Brown May for her hard work on this bill and uh, would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else in support in the room? Seeing no one on Zoom, anyone in support on the phone line? Chair, there are no callers on the line in support at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in opposition in the room? Seeing no one in opposition, no one on Zoom. Is there anyone in opposition on the phone line? Chair, we have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. We're going to go for neutral. Folks in neutral, please come up. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlton. I will make this quick because I know we are late. Elliot Mallon, for the record, on behalf of the Nevada Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association. Um, we are neutral on the bill. We just want to make sure we have it on the record that the uh, Nevada Administrative Code through the Department of Ag um, allows the, for the department to do this. Uh, we do have a few concerns with pre-2007 cars and misfueling um, and just labeling, uh, which I think we can work through, uh, and as well as storage tanks and their ability to hold higher alcohol content and seeing how that will work. So uh, we look forward to being part of the regulatory process, and I said I'd be brief. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mellon. We appreciate your professionalism. So with that, that is neutral in the room. There is no neutral on Zoom. Uh, any neutral on the phone line, please? Chair, there are no callers in neutral on the line at this time. Thank you very much. Assemblywoman, any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Assemblywoman Brown may for the record. I just want to um, put on record that we're happy to continue to work with the proponents who are in support of this bill to enable all of the regulations necessary to safely dis deploy E15 gasoline throughout the state. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 411. And committee members, I think you're about to cross the finish line. The last bill for this evening is Assembly Bill 427, but don't get too excited. Right after we do the bill, we're going to do work session on some bills to keep things moving. So with that, I'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 427. Do we have someone here to present Assembly Bill 427? Okay, what happened? Good evening, Mr. Sever. How are you? And Miss Davy. Hello, Chair. Okay. I'll let I'll let Miss Davy start. Miss Sever from B. 
Thank you very much. Ms. Davey, if you would proceed, please. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, committee members. Thank you for your perseverance this evening. Um, I'm Amy Davey with the Department of Public Safety. Um, the Departments of Public Safety, Motor Vehicles, and Transportation want to thank uh, Chairman Yeager and Assemblywoman Wynn for, uh, and the uh, Assembly uh, Judiciary Committee for working uh, with us to address technical corrections to legislation from the 2019 session um, that have resulted in compliance issues with federal requirements um, related to repeat DUI offenders. The crux of AB 427 is to make corrections to DUI statutes to conform with 23 CFR 1275, also referred to as Section 164. Um, also included in this bill are proposals related to the use of ignition interlock devices and 24-7 sobriety programs. Um, and uh, the bill um, also had some input from um, uh, related to DUI sentencing from Judge Scott Pearson at Reno Municipal Court. The fiscal notes posted in Nellis are zero dollar um, fiscal notes. Um, I, I, I believe that the fiscal impact to the state that um, is recognized in this bill is probably related to what is called the penalty transfer tax, um, which um, exists uh, uh, because of the um, issues with compliance with federal requirements. This impacts um, NDOT highway construction funds um, that's that's the gist of the bill. There may be some questions about um, components related to DMV licensure. I will try to, I'll, I'll defer to um, Mr. Sever on those, and then I'll try to answer on behalf of NDOT. Um, I don't believe that they're um, present this evening. Thank you, Mr. Sever. Hello, Chair, committee members from DMV. Uh, this bill will simplify the DMV administrative hearing process well as clarify uh, existing language to help the program be easier to understand, which, which is a good thing. Uh, we did submit a fiscal note on the bill, uh, no impact, because we're, we're willing to absorb the programming hours and additional workload with existing staff. So thank you for your time today. Mr. Sever, did you just say yeah. that you are going to absorb programming hours at the DMV? We did, or I did, Sean Sever. <laughs> Would you mind submitting that in writing <laughs> with your next PowerPoint, please? <laughs> I'm, I have been in this building too long. Things have truly changed. Okay. So with that, uh, committee members, seriously though, are there any questions of Mr. Sever? So I guess what I'd like to understand is what's the problem you're trying to fix? You know me, I asked the question. Yes, uh, this is Amy Davey with the Department of Public Safety. Um, the crux of the problem has to do with what's known um, as repeat offender DUI laws and federal requirements. Um, in the 2019 session, some legislation that was, was passed that triggered a non-compliant situation. And um, we were notified um, of this non-compliance. And as such, there's um, we're, Nevada's uh, federal highway funds through NDOT are subject to what's called a penalty transfer. Um, so NDOT is required to transfer, um, well, in the first year the, uh, of the non-compliance, $8.1 million um, out of construction and infrastructure funds um, into other required um, programs um, related, to, um, related to this DUI non-compliance. Um, additionally, we've been working with DMV over the last two biennium to, um, uh, to, to address some improvements in the ignition interlock program, um, to uh, bring 24-7 um, programs. Um, Assemblywoman Tolls um, sponsored some legislation last session, and so we're continuing to work on those, uh, the language in those programs to bring those into conformance with um, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration standards and best practices. But really, the crux of this is to address that non-compliance um, issue. Thank you very much. When it gets this late, I just need it spelled out for me, and that way I've got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. So with that, committee members, are there any questions? So is the, the non-compliance portions of the bill, is that what's generating the two-thirds vote 
that would be section 11 or is that another issue I'm not knowledgeable enough to be able to, to answer um, what the, the ins and outs of it are. I apologize in, in, in terms of the legislation, uh, legislative requirements. Oh, and that's perfectly fine. We don't mind that at all. We'd much rather have that answer. We'll investigate it and, and move forward uh, to make sure that we understand the different components of the bill. So, Mr. Sever, did you have any other comments? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Sean Sever, DMV. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here this late in the evening. So with that committee member not seeing any questions at this time, for the presenters, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 427. I'll go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone in the room in support of Assembly Bill 427? Not seeing anyone come forward and no one on Zoom. Is there anyone on the phone line in support of Assembly Bill 427? Chair, we have no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Anyone in the room in opposition? Seeing none, no one on Zoom. Anyone on the phone in opposition? Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone in the room in neutral? Seeing none, no one on Zoom. Anyone on neutral in the phone lines? Chair, there are no callers in neutral on the line at this time. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, any closing comments? I don't believe so. I think we're good. With that, committee members will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 427. We have made it through the agenda today, but everybody hold tight. We need to get some bills moved so that the process can keep rolling.
Okay, committees, thank you for your patience. We've gone from having a list to having a pile. So with that, um, I'll, we'll go ahead and start, and I will definitely stand to be corrected, uh, Ms. Kaufman, if I go down the wrong path. So I believe the first bill that we would like to, just, just for the committee's edification, um, we're looking at Assembly Bill 230, and then we're going to moved, moved, hold. Uh, Assembly Bill 224. Then we'll be looking at Assembly Bill 247, Assembly Bill 270. 280 will wait because we have to amend in the appropriation and we have to make sure the numbers are correct. 280 will wait. Um, the elections bills will be moved this evening. So that would be uh, 126, 321, and 422. And also we'll move speakers AB 220 this evening. We will move Assembly Bill 371. 376 has an appropriation, needs to wait till tomorrow to put the appropriation in it. Oh, we did 220 already. Oh, I want to do it twice. Yeah, okay. Twice is right. Um, then we'll move Assembly Bill 411. 422 is one of the elections bills. We will move that. I'm still a little confused by 427, so I'm going to hold that one for a minute to make sure that I have a thorough understanding of it. And then we will move SB 450. And I believe that will pretty much clear our decks so that things can keep rolling right through. So with that, committee members will go ahead and start with Assembly Bill 430. A, an amendment was proposed on Assembly Bill 430. I'll ask Ms. Kaufman to go through the bill. 230. 230. Oh, man, I'm getting dyslexic. My eyes are crossing. Go ahead, Ms. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 230, as amended, revises the jurisdiction of juvenile courts. The bill provides that sexual assault and attempted sexual assault involving the use of or threatened use of force of violence and an offense of uh, an offense or attempted offense involving the use of threats threatened use of uh, firearms under the juris jurisdiction of the judicial uh, juvenile court rather than the criminal justice system in addition uh, the mandatory certification of a child as an adult for these offenses is eliminated and instead um, measures provided for the discretionary certification of child for criminal proceedings as, re as an adult uh, for all the offenses over which the juvenile court has exclusive jurisdiction. I would point out that there was a conceptual amendment that was presented by Assemblyman uh, Miller to um, delete Section 7.5 um, in its entirety, which related to a study um, requiring the interim study of, uh, excuse me, the interim study of housing for youthful offenders. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I believe that is the only amendment. Okay. Committee members, are there any questions on Assembly Bill 230? That is one that we did here uh, a while back, but did need some work. And then with the conversations about studies this session, we realize what our limitations will be. So the uh, Assemblyman graciously accepted the uh, suggestion to eliminate the study from the bill. So are there any other questions or concerns on Assembly Bill 230? Seeing none, and I don't have this one on my list, was this the first reprint? So the motion on this bill would be an amend and do pass as amended. I'll take from Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, a second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? 
Hearing none, you got here just in time, Mr. Miller. We just voted on your bill. You're good. <laughs> I love that freshman enthusiasm. I used to be that enthusiastic. It's not done yet, Mr. Miller. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, I believe we can go to um, uh, which one did we have next? 224? Okay, all right. Assembly Bill 224, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 224, as amended, provides for access of ministerial products for each uh, middle school and junior high school um, and high school in each school district and certain charter schools. Uh, the products must be made available at no cost to pupils. Among other things, uh, the Board of Trustees of each school district and the governing bodies of applicable charter schools must develop plans to address the lack of access to menstrual products due to affordability and to provide equal access to such products. There was an, an amendment that was uh, recommended and it provided that uh, middle schools, junior high schools, and high schools in each uh, school district would provide 25% of certain charter schools with the same uh, sponsor um, that operated the middle schools and high, middle schools, junior high schools, and high schools to provide menstrual products at no cost to um, pupils in certain uh, restrooms oh. and Ms. Kaufman if I could stop you for a moment I believe that's encapsulated in the amendment that was already adopted in the oh. policy committee uh, I apologize I think I have a mock-up okay then I, I apologize then so that is a, the proposed amendment at this time madam chair that is correct okay and I misunderstood thank you with regard to the fiscal notes, uh, both Washoe County and Clark County uh, both uh, provided uh, testimony related to the costs associated with each of the school districts, and uh, there was uh, no one available from the Department of Education to speak to their fiscal note. However, they had provided a fiscal note of $10,000 in fiscal year 22 and $5,000 in 2023. Thank you very much. Let's hold on for just a second. So I believe the uh, amendment that we're discussing is the free and reduced lunch component that was proposed, Ms. Kaufman? Too many amendments. Madam Chair, I apologize. That is correct. So the amendment uh, amends Section 3.3 .3 and indicates that, um, that uh, in the immediately preceding consecutive years had the highest percentage of pupils who received free and reduced lunch in the school and the school districts or charter schools uh, of the same sponsor in relation to the 25% of the middle schools, junior high schools and high schools that would be eligible for uh, this uh, service. Okay. Thank you very much. So committee members, I think we've got it clarified now. Are there any questions from any of the committee members at this time? Seeing none, so we are working off of a first reprint. So this would be an amend and do pass as amended. I'll accept the motion from Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, second from Dr. Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing none, passes unanimously of the members present. And we'll just hand these back to the sponsors of the bills to handle on the floor. That will just be our general theory going for now. Moving on to the next bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 247, as amended, revises various provisions relating to the Western Regional Education Compact. Uh, specifically, it deletes certain provisions concerning interest rates, payback provisions, and penalties, and requires uh, three Nevada State commissioner, Commissioners acting jointly adopt regulations governing these matters. Um, re 
regards to the fiscal impact, Section 14 removes the requirement that 25% of the professional student exchange program support be uh, repaid by participants. And the Nevada uh, WICHE estimates that lost revenue would equal approximately $409,892 in future biennia. Are there any questions or comments from the committee at this time on Assembly Bill 247? Seeing any questions or comments? With that, we are working from a first reprint, so this would be an amend and do pass as amended. Take a motion from uh, uh, Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, a second from Dr. Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing none, passes unanimously of the members present. Uh, Ms. Bedinas Thompson, that one's yours on the floor. Moving on to the next bill, which would be Assembly Bill 270. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 270. I'm sorry. The one we just did? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was okay. Yeah, it was amended. Yeah, first reprint. So with that, uh, Assembly Bill 270, Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 270, as amended, requires that any money received for special events held at or on uh, the buildings or grounds of former uh, Stewart Indian School be credited to the Nevada Indian Commission's gift fund to carry out programs to preserve and maintain the building and grounds of the former uh, Stewart Indian School. I would note um, that the fiscal notes uh, that were uh, provided by the Department of Corrections uh, have been uh, addressed with the amendment. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. Committee members, are there any questions or comments on Assembly Bill 270? Not seeing any. This We are working from a first reprint. This would be, there was no proposed amendments, so this would be due pass as amended from Ms. Monroe Moreno, a second from Dr. Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of the members present. I believe the we're skipping to 80 to get the appropriations correct. I believe we're going to Assembly Bill 321. Oh, we did skip 126. I apologize. Let's go back and get 126 done. Let's go back to the top of the order. I apologize. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 126, as amended, establishes the requirement and procedures uh, for conducting a presidential uh, preference primary election to be held by each major political party on the first Tuesday in February of each presidential election year. Uh, the state must pay the costs of this election from the reserve for statutory contingency account and Assembly Bill 126 uh, revises the period for filing de a declaration of candidacy for all candidates except for candidates in a presidential pre uh, preference primary to begin the last Monday in February of the election year and ending the third Feb uh, Friday after the Monday in February. I would note um, that there is no fiscal impact for this biennium. Uh, and there were future um, uh, future expenditures that were identified in, in the following um, uh, biennium of about $5.2 million. And to clarify, was there a proposed amendment to this bill? No? Striking section 6.5. Yes. Yes. Okay. I believe we can go ahead and move forward. We don't want we're 
it's a it's a simple amendment. I believe we can go ahead and move forward with statements that were made on the re on the record and confirmation from the speaker that we could go ahead and process this now. So, with that, committee members, this would be amended to strike section six point five. So this would be an amend and do pass as amended since we are working from the first reprint. I have a motion from Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, a second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Question or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. And those opposed? Aye. Uh, Dr. Titus, Mr. Hafen, Mr. Lovett are in opposition. Motion carries. So with that, we'll move forward. I'll take that one on the floor. And then now 321. Yes, please. Oops, sorry, guys. Wouldn't think paper would do that, would you? <laughs> Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 321, as amended, makes various changes to the Nevada election statute. The bill replaces existing laws concerning ballot for absentee voters, uh, mailing precincts, and mail ballots with new provisions that require mail ballots in all elections, and opt-in uh, provision is available for uh, any active voter who prefers to not use the mail-in ballot. I would note that the uh, Secretary of State provided a fiscal note of approximately $6.8 million in fiscal year 2022 and $6.3 million in fiscal year 2023. However, during testimony uh, today, uh, Susan Brown, the director of the governor's finance office, indicated that uh, the ballot stock that uh, was purchased for the uh, prior uh, election uh, estimated cost was approximately $3.9 million, uh, which is um, approximately $1.7 million less than the $5.7 million in each year that was identified in the fiscal note. Uh, there was also discussion related to uh, the need for uh, ballot drop boxes, as uh, these were uh, previously furnished to the counties, in addition to discussion related to uh, the media campaigns. Uh, accordingly, if the uh, amount for ballot stock were reduced to uh, $3.9 million and the uh, expenditures related to ballot drop boxes as well as voter education outreach were eliminated, the costs associated uh, with this would be reduced to uh, $6,286,844 in fiscal year 2022 and $5,998,138 in fiscal year 2023. Committee members, any questions on Assembly Bill 321? Hearing none, um, with the change in the fiscal note, so Ms. Kaufman, the numbers that you uh, just recited for us would end up being the appropriation that would be encapsulated with the bill in order to fund the bill, correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. So with that, we will be in amending an appropriation into the bill. We are working off of a first reprint. So it would be an amend and do pass as amended. I would accept a motion from Ms. Bedinas Thompson, a second from Vice Chair Monroe Moreno. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in, oh, Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm going to be a no on this. We, I think we had a good discussion about opt-in versus opt-out um, with the cost. And um, But if, if we could have discussions about maybe going back to changing that, I would be very glad to have those discussions moving forward. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. And those in opposition? 
I have Dr. Titus, Mr. Hafen, Assemblywoman Tolls, Mr. Lovett, and Mr. Roberts in opposition. Motion carries. Moving on from there, I'll handle that one on the floor too. Ms. Kaufman, the next bill would be Assembly Bill. Then we have 370, we have the ones from today. Yeah, just do them in order. That makes it easier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 371, um, as amended, extends provisions relating to bullying and cyberbullying to additionally prohibit and address discrimination based on race. Further, um, among other items, the bill requires the governing body of school districts or charter schools to categorize an incident of discrimination based on race as a racially motivated hate incident. I would note uh, that there were fiscal notes uh, originally provided for, however, um, with the uh, amendment on the original bill, the fiscal notes were removed. And Thank you very much. So with that, committee members, are there any questions on Assembly Bill 371 at this time? Not seeing any questions. With that, um, let me make sure. It is the first reprint, so this would be an amend and do pass as amended. I'll accept a motion from Vice Chair. I'm sorry? Is there an amendment? Oh, do pass is amended. I'm sorry. I apologize. So we are working from the first reprint. The motion would be do pass as amended from Vice Chair Monroe Moreno, a second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Here are no opposition passes unanimously of the members present. Ms. Miller, you can handle this one on the floor since it's your bill. Thank you, sir. With that, I believe we can move to Assembly Bill 382. What did you have next? Yeah. Assembly Bill 382. The Education Loans Bill. You just heard it, the loan bill. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we missed it. Give us just a moment, we skipped one. I apologize, that one has to have an appropriation added to it, so we'll need to do that. Um, we need to make sure we have the correct number. I apologize, Ms. Kaufman. I had marked that down incorrectly. So with that, I believe we can go to Assembly Bill 411. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 411 requires that the regulations adopted by the State Board of Agriculture, State Department of Agriculture for motor vehicles allows a sale of motor vehicle uh, fuel containing not more than 15% of ethanol uh, by volume. I would note um, that there were fiscal notes on the original bill, however, uh, based off of the uh, amendment that was provided, uh, those uh, fiscal notes have been, or the fiscal impact has been removed. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from committee members at this time? Seeing none. Is it a first reprint? Okay, so this would be do pass as amended. So the motion for Assembly Bill 411 would be do pass as amended from Ms. Monroe Moreno, second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Any questions or comments? Hearing none. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Aye. I have an opposition from Dr. Titus, Mr. Hafen, Assemblywoman Tolls, Mr. Lovett. Um, in opposition, motion carries. 
we'll go ahead and have uh, the assembly one Assemblywoman carry that bill on the floor. The next bill is Assembly Bill 422. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 422 requires the Secretary of State to create a centralized top down database that collects and stores voter pre registration and registration information for all counties. Uh, county clerks must use the database to collect and maintain records of voter pre registration and, and registration. The Secretary of State is required to use the database to create the official statewide uh, voter registration list. I would note that the Secretary of State had a fiscal note of $5.1 million in fiscal year 2022 and $4.1 million in fiscal year 2023. However, representatives from the Secretary of State indicated that they would be able to use uh, HAVA funds to support these um, expenditures, and so no general fund appropriations are, are needed at this time. Thank you very much. So with that, committee members, are there any questions on Assembly Bill 422? Not seeing any questions or comments. This is the first reprint. There was no proposed amendments. So this would just be a due pass as amended from Ms. Monroe Moreno, a second from Dr. Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of the members present. Uh, we're going to wait on 427. We st I still have some uh, questions about that. 447 will be amended into a different bill. Our next bill will be SB 450. And then um, committee and Ms. Kaufman, I have been notified that the fiscal concerns on Assembly Bill 486 have been addressed through an email from Justice Hardesty. So we will be considering 486 at the very end of this agenda. Just wanted to give the committee um, heads up on that. So with that, we can go to SB 450. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate Bill uh, 450 uh, provides that with existing law. The uh, existing law authorizes the Board of Trustees of a school district to issue general obligation bonds to support certain uh, specified purposes related to school facilities if approved by qualified electors in an election. If such a question uh, for the issuance of bonds for a school district has been approved by the voters, existing law authorizes the Board of Trustees of the school district to issue general obligation, obligation bonds for one additional period of 10 years without any further approval by the voters of certain, uh, if certain conditions are met. Senate Bill 450 authorizes the Board of Trustees of a school district to issue general obligation bonds for a second additional period of 10 years without any further approval of the voters and regardless of the time of the approval of the uh, ballot question. All right. Committee members, are there any questions on SB 450? Not seeing any questions at this time. This would be a due pass if I am reading my notations correctly. So with that, wow, we don't get those much. So with that, I would have a due pass from um, Majority Leader Benitez Thompson, a second from Vice Chair Mon Monroe Moreno. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Aye. I have a nay from Dr. Titus, Mr. Hafen. I have two nays, motion passes on SB 450. Um, Mr. Yeager, if you're listening, now is the time to come to the Ways and Means room. I can talk faster than I can type. Uh, we're just gonna wait for him because I want him to, I wanna make sure we have a complete record for the amendment that Justice Hardesty uh, sent over. It was late in the process, but I don't wanna slow this down a whole day just to verify an amendment, so. I have uh, Ms. Portland and Mr. Brown. We're just waiting for Chair Yeager, and we will address it.
Chair Yeager, nice to see you. Welcome to Ways and Means After Dark. We're not at Ways and Means at midnight yet, so you're ahead of the curve. So, Chair Yeager, um, Assembly Bill 486. Um, if you would give us a brief update on the, and I'm losing my voice, I apologize. <clears throat> if you would give us a brief update on the amendment that was proposed by uh, Justice Hardesty to deal with the uh, fiscal notes that arrived after the hearing to make sure that everyone was on the same page as we move forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Yeager for the record. So in the um, most recent amendment that I submitted, which is a supplement to the amendment we reviewed yesterday, if you look at uh, bullet point number 13 on there, which is on page number four, it talks about the mediation program. And the amendment simply states that the mediation program in section four of the bill would expire on June 5th, 2023. That's what's already in the bill. And then the new language is, or when there is no longer funding available to pay for mediators and the administration of the program, whichever is earlier. So in conversations with uh, Justice Hardesty, I think that does satisfy his concerns that they might run out of money to fund the mediation program prior to June 5th of 2023. Although in uh, candor and, uh, to the committee, I think there will be additional federal funding available, but obviously we can't count on that. But with that amendment, uh, Justice Hardy and Hardesty had indicated to me uh, in writing that that would uh, take care of their fiscal note on the bill. So thank you very much, Chairman Yeager, and, and thank you for being one of the people in this building that doesn't want to spend the money we don't have yet. We do appreciate that. So uh, committee members, are there any questions of Mr. Yeager at this time? Seeing none, so that would be encapsulated in the current amendment that was proposed yesterday. Um, Steve Yeager, for the record. Madam Chair, just so I can be clear, uh, there was an amendment that was submitted yesterday, and then there was some supplemental language added to that amendment, um, which I think the committee has in front of them, but just so we're, sh we're clear on the, the, the title page of that amendment, it says, Submission After May 24th Hearing, and it is dated May 25th, 2021. So that would be the amendment that I would request that the committee process. I believe that's it. So we do have every, we have the, you have your, the amendment. Would you pull that up so they can see it? Everyone has it at their desk. It was given to you earlier this evening. and this language would be in addition to that amendment. Steve Yeager, Steve Yeager for the record, cor correct, Madam Chair. And if you're looking at that amendment, uh, the beginning part of it is just what was already in the prior amendment. And then when you get to page four, there's a highlighted area. And so the material underneath that are the additions that have been made since yesterday morning. I think it was yesterday morning's presentation. Yes, it was yesterday. So, committee members, do you have any questions of Chairman Yeager on the, uh, yes, Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, I, and trying to uh, digest <laughs> all these amendments and stuff, if, just quite, if the eviction moratorium only covers non-payment of rent cases, um, which instances when the rental assistance is appropriate, why are other types of evictions being included in the bill? Are they, are they still in there, or did this amendment take them out? Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record. So essentially what this amendment does is it says that any case that has a component of non-payment of rent would be eligible were this bill to pass for eviction mediation with a couple exceptions, one being nuisance, the other one being uh, squatters. Uh, so it, it would amplify the cases because right now it's only cases that are strictly non-payment of rent. What this amendment says, if non-payment of rent is a component of the eviction proceeding, then 
uh, that would potentially be eligible for the eviction mediation program as well. And the reasoning there is we want to catch everybody who is behind on their rent, uh, whether or not that's the stated reason for the eviction to make sure that we're not having uh, folks fall through the crack when payment of the rent would in truth satisfy whatever the issue is between the tenant and the landlord. Okay, thank, thank you. Quick follow-up. Sure. And in the additional um, mediation component, does that add another 30 days to the eviction process? Or Because I remember we did something special session. I, I want to try to figure out w what the timeline is now. Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record, uh, excellent question, Assemblyman Robertson. If you look at bullet point number 12 on the amendment on page 4, what you'll see that we're doing there is we are actually repealing the language from the bill we passed in the special session with eviction mediation and replacing it with uh, the new language in this bill. So there was potentially a conflict in the statutes there, and um, I should note I've had discussions with the court about that as well. So to get to the, uh, to the answer to your question, it's going to be 30 days, period. So we've eliminated what would be a duplicative and potentially confusing to have two different things in the statute. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Mr. Roberts. I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with the document that they have. Um, I'll go to S Assemblywoman Hadegi, and then I'll go to Mr. Hafen afterwards. Assemblywoman Hadegi. Thank you, um, Chair. And I just want to confirm, so I saw, I saw the two references to Section 7 in the amendment, so we're still leaving the pot of money as $5 million, but then I saw in the last bullet point that we are increasing the compensation to landlords to 100%, correct? Steve Yeager, for the record. Um, yes, we are leaving the pot of money at $5 million. The change there in uh, Amendment Bullet Point 10 was just that we we tweak the language to more reflect what, what we are intending to do. Um, in discussion with interested folks, including uh, folks from the Realtors and the Apartment Association, um, I did agree that 100% probably made more sense. Um, and again, I heard the concerns from the committee about whether that $5 million was going to go far enough. Um, I think this is a start and certainly have uh, my commitment with my legislative colleagues uh, were this bill to pass. If that money is not adequate to try to find some additional funding, hopefully from the federal government to be able to replenish those funds and make as many landlords whole as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Assemblywoman Hadegi. Mr. Hafen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Assemblyman Yeager. Um, I, the way I read this now, the couple things. One, I think you stated the fiscal notes now being removed. I apologize. I was trying to scramble to find this amendment. It appears to not be on my desk. Um, and now we're going to 100%. Uh, but I remember in that same section there was a, a clause that said they, they could not evict, or they could not start the eviction process for 90 days. That's not changing in this amendment. That's still going to be in the language. Steve Yeager, for the record, that's correct. That would still be in the language. Uh, but just as a point of clarification, that's only if the landlord chooses to avail him or herself of that $5 million relief money and if they get that money. So, you know, for instance, if they don't want that money and they just want to evict flat out, they can do that. So there would be the option, but if they choose to avail themselves of the $5 million unrestricted funds at 100% of back rent, then they'd be agreeing not to initiate uh, eviction proceedings for 90 days. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assemblyman Haven, uh, Dr. Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Yeager, uh, for, for taking on some questions this late at night. And I probably should have asked this during the original hearing. I thought about it afterwards, and now it's still in my brain, interestingly enough, at this late hour. What happens if the landlord... Um, loses his property because he hasn't he or she haven't been able to make their mortgage payment so the property then goes back to the bank or mortgage company does this affect the mortgage company from now evicting these folks because many landlords have lost their places because of all this madam chair Steve Yeager with your permission I may have to phone a friend on this one Bailey Bordelin, for the record, representing the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. Um, thank you for the question. So I want to be clear that to date that has not happened in Nevada because the governor's protections specifically have an exception um, for a foreclosure situation. So um, what we have built into this structure here is similar in that if it's not appropriate to avail yourself of um, 
the situation can be reviewed by a judge if the landlord files a motion to place the case on calendar. So if there was a situation that the court needed to take into consideration, they would be able to do that. Thank you, Dr. Titus. Committee members, are there any other questions at this time? Not seeing any other questions. This, uh, so with that, thank you very much, uh, Assemblyman Yeager, for being here to walk us through the uh, amendment that you had on your desk with the additional language uh, dealing with the fiscal notes that um, did arrive so that we'll make sure that money is used to the extent that it is available. When it's gone, it's gone, knowing full well that there might be federal dollars available at another time. So this would be an amend, first reprint. No, this was straight to us. That's correct. This bill came straight to us. So this would be an amend and do pass. Are there any questions or comments on before we move forward? Seeing none, I would accept an amend and do pass from Assemblywoman Hadegi. A second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Comments? Hearing uh, Mr. Hafen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, I know the fiscal note's been removed now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and vote this out of committee, but I do want to digest the policy overnight. Um, so I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Mr. Hafen. I know the first time I was on this committee and things moved this quick, it was hard to keep up. I get it. If you have any questions, myself, Chairman Yeager, this is the world that I live in. This is the world that he is trying to live in. I don't know why he wants to move into this world, but we'll be happy to have conversations with you. I, so I, I, I appreciate that, Madam Chair. Uh, Assemblyman Yeager, I might need a donut in the morning. <laughs> it's tomorrow's only Wednesday. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I know it hurts. I know it hurts. So. With that, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by. Oh, Mr. Roberts, I apologize. I'll be real, I'll be real quick. I think, I think the amendment and the answers tonight uh, addressed my concerns. Pretty sure they did. Uh, if that changes, which I doubt it will, but I, I will let you know if it does. So thank you. Thank I'll you. be voting and yes. We understand that. So with that, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And those in opposition. Aye. I have one in opposition and Dr. Titus and a couple on the fence, but that's okay. Motion passes. Um, with that, and I will have, oh, did we miss something? I think we need to restore one. This was a due process amendment, 247, and we did an amend due process amendment. Oh, I'm not on this bill. On it's this okay, bill. Mr. Yeager, okay, this is not it. on your bill. Don't, it's okay, don't jump out of your chair. Thank you, Mr. Brown, thank you. So with that, that motion passes. We made it incorrect motion earlier, committee. I apologize, so we need to reconsider a bill. So I would move to uh, rescind our previous action on Assembly Bill 247. Take a motion from Ms. Benitez Thompson, a second from Speaker Frierson. Questions? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition. I would move on Assembly Bill 247 that is a due pass as amended. I'll take a motion from Ms. Monroe Moreno, second from Ms. Benitez Thompson. Questions or comments? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing none, passes unanimously of the members present. I think we have done as much as we could have possibly done in a day. Um, you guys are great. Thank you very much for hanging up. You just made the rest of the week a little bit e easier. I hate to tell you this now, but tomorrow's going to be this day part two. Uh, we'll be back in here off and on. We'll be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're waiting for the large bills to come. We still have assembly bills to process. And uh, I believe we have CIP appropriations and authorizations are coming to us. Uh, oh, we have the pay bill coming to us. So we have a couple different bills that we're gonna have to review tomorrow. So we'll be going through this all over again tomorrow, but thank you all for hanging tough. If you need anything, let me know. With that committee, we are adjourned. Public oh, public comment. Okay, I am just so used to
So with that, broadcast services, is there anyone on the phone line for public comment for Ways and Means this evening? Chair, the public comment line is open and working. However, we have no callers at this time. Thank you very much, broadcast services. With that, we are adjourned.